whistleblowers from Hanford Nuclear Waste Treatment Site in Washington State participated in a discussion with senators. Some of the workers were fired after reporting about safety concerns. Later, testimony from Energy Department officials and executives representing contractors working at Hanford. Senator Claire McCaskill chairs the Financial and Contracting Oversight Subcommittee. discussion and, and not an official hearing of the committee, I'd like to begin today by welcoming all of you to this discussion. I'm really um, pleased that you were able to be here today. I know you've come a long way. I appreciate that. Um, this discussion represents the intersection of the subcommittee's ongoing oversight of whistleblower protections and the Department of Energy's contract management, both areas that I have done, um, and this subcommittee has done a significant amount of work around both of those issues. After the conclusion of this discussion, we'll proceed to the third subcommittee hearing on these topics that we have actually uh, had in this subcommittee. The focus of today's discussion is the safety culture at Hanford and the allegations of whistleblower retaliation that resulted when safety and technical concerns were brought to the attention of the Department of Energy and Contractor Management. Hanford has been in the news again lately because yet another contractor employee at the waste treatment plant who raised safety concerns was fired. These actions contribute to a strong perception, both within Hanford and outside of it, that the contractors and the Department of Energy are failing to put an adequate emphasis on creating a strong safety culture at Hanford. Today, I wanted to give fellow members of Congress and the public an opportunity to hear from some of those individuals familiar with this situation at Hanford. Donna Bushy? Yes, ma'am is the former environmental and nuclear safety manager at the waste treatment plant. She has over 20 years of experience in nuclear safety. She was fired by URS in February of this year. Dr. Walter Tamasitis is the former research and technology manager and assistant chief process engineer for the waste treatment plant. Dr. Tamasitis has over 40 years of experience in the chemical and nuclear industries. He was fired by URS in December of 2013. And Tom Carpenter is the executive director of the advocacy group Hanford Challenge. Mr. Carpenter has decades of experience in policy oversight of the nuclear field and whistleblower advocacy. He helped establish and is a member of the Hanford Concerns Council. Let me turn it over to Senator Johnson if he would like to say a few words, and then we would um, love to uh, ask each of you to um, give a, a brief statement, and then we'll have some questions. Okay, thank you. Well, well certainly, uh, Madam Chair, I certainly appreciate your efforts. Uh, trying to get the, to the bottom of, of what this government needs to do, what the U.S. has to do in terms of cleaning up these nuclear sites. Uh, I'm, I'm relatively new to the issue, uh, and so I, I really don't come to this issue with any, any biases or any assumptions. Uh, I, I think my assumption would be that nobody at the table here, the companies, not current government employees, caused the problem. That was done decades ago, and it is a huge problem. It's an incredibly complex problem. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a nuclear engineer. Uh, my guess is because of the complexity, uh, because of the difficult nature of this problem, there's going to be certainly differences of, of opinion in terms of how to approach it. Uh, I really, you know, I would like to think, whether it's the government employees, or whether it's the, the contractors that are, you know, basically agreeing to take on this task and try and grapple with this very difficult situation, my guess is everybody's trying to solve this problem. But it's incredibly, like I say, enormous, uh, complex, and difficult issue. So I certainly want to get all the information. Uh, you know, appreciate you coming here today. And uh, with that, just wanted to hear what you have to say. Okay. Happy to. Uh, why don't we begin with, with you, Ms. Bushy, and a few minutes to say whatever you'd like to say in terms of where you find yourself and what you think is relevant, knowing that our concern is whistleblower protections and contract management. I mean, yes. those are basically the two uh, cornerstones that this hearing uh, that we're going to have in, in another hour or so um, are really about. So why don't you each take a few minutes? And then I've got some questions, and I'm sure Senator Johnson may have some questions. Okay. Um, I'll keep my remarks pretty, pretty, pretty brief so that we can actually, I think, get 
afford you the opportunity with questions so that we might be able to help your investigation. So I think everyone knows me. My name is Donna Bushy. I was the former manager of environmental and nuclear safety at the waste treatment plant. Um, my, my responsibilities included making sure that the dangerous waste permit that is actually one of the governing documents for the environmental cleanup mission that we provided and complied with the terms and conditions of that dangerous waste permit. And the more controversial side was the nuclear safety side um, where um, I would summarize my job as making sure that we adequately implement the Department of Energy's requirements to integrate safety into the design. So most people resonate with Fukushima, right? I'm not advocating that we're going to have a Fukushima, we're not going to have an earthquake and a tsunami, but the parallels from the Department of Energy's regulations are very similar to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So we analyze hazards and then we must make sure that there's controls adequate to handle the hazards of the highly radioactive and toxic waste in the waste tanks. Um, my journey, I believe, started at the waste treatment plant in 2009, and I was on good rapport with the company, URS, Bechtel, the Department of Energy, until a fortuitous meeting with Dr. Walter Tamasitis, where we identified some key issues at that time, a highly controversial technical issue of mixing, and I think that was the subject of the one of your previous um, hearings. Um, in that meeting, it was not received well, it being the 56 comments and questions that Dr. Walter Tamasitis raised. Um, when I reviewed that list, I identified that, and these are my words, holy moly, there's quite a few of these that have not been adequately an analyzed to understand the hazards and what needs to go into the design. From that point forward, I was requested to, to attend a public meeting from the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board where I provided uh, testimony in uh, three panels um, that were quite controversial, um, where I took positions technically that may have been differing opinions, as you put it, um, Senator Johnson. But um, in, in the nuclear business, we must have unwavering, comp tech, I mean, unwavering commitment to making sure that we comply with the regulations and execute the public trust that has been endeared to us. So I took a conservative stance, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, supported that stance and so did many other in the technical community. Um, after that, I was requested to um, be deposed in Walter Tamasitis's case. I was subpoenaed for a closed testimony with the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. And miraculously, after that, I now have performance issues. And I would characterize if you disagree with URS or Bechtel and making sure that we build the waste treatment plant, not design it safely, build the waste treatment plant, that you're labeled with performance issues, attitude issues, don't get along with colleagues. So I stayed until I was um, uh, terminated from my employment on February 18th. I'm gonna interrupt, if you don't mind, Dr. Tomasitis, and give my colleague, Ron Wyden, who I know has been interested and active on this issue, and give him a, a few moments to uh, make comments. Uh, we've just, Dr. Uh, Donna Bushy just finished explaining her situation, and then the other two witnesses were going to um, give an informal presentation, and then we're just going to have informal questioning between the whistleblowers. And Chair, Chair McCaskill, thank you, first of all, for doing this. This is extraordinarily important because if we're going to have the kind of safety agenda that we need in this country, We've got to get the truth out. That's the bottom line, and I'm particularly pleased that you have three individuals that I've had a chance to talk to, in the case of Mr. Carpenter, uh, for practically two decades, I, I believe now, and Dr. Tamasitis and uh, Ms. Bushy uh, as well, and getting the real story of the problems at the Department of uh, Energy's Hanford site is hugely important for our part of the world. As uh, some of you know, uh, Hanford essentially adjoins the Columbia River, which is our lifeblood for uh, quality of life and recreation and business and a whole host of, uh, of needs. And the reality is Hanford, is Hanford is a lasting and dangerous legacy of the federal government's nuclear weapons production activities, including millions of gallons of high-level radioactive waste. And for decades, uh, secrecy was a way of life at Hanford. First, because it was necessary to protect uh, nuclear weapons secrets, but later it became a way of hiding the true environmental impacts of decades of plutonium production. 
And what you're going to hear from these uh, three today and hopefully a number of times in the days ahead because working with my colleagues, and I'm glad to see uh, Senator Johnson here as well, we really need to dig in and get the truth out about the problems at the site. We're talking about uh, contamination of groundwater to safety problems at the waste treatment uh, plant. And the reality is, uh, and I say this to our chair and our colleague, Senator Johnson, the only way these serious matters have become public knowledge is because courageous, committed employees like these two individuals have come forward to tell us and to tell uh, the American people. And I'll close up uh, uh, Senator McCaskill with just two last points. First, independent reviews essentially corroborate their point of view. Uh, both uh, the Defense Nuclear F Facility Safety Board and its own safety inspectors found that Hanford has maintained a culture that at best has thwarted uh, the ability of employees to come forward and at worst has threatened their careers and livelihood. And the fact that with respect to Dr. Tamasitis and Ms. Bushy that they were fired after this issue has gotten so much attention by uh, the independent observers, by you uh, as our chair, uh, Senator McCaskill, and myself when I was chair of the Energy Committee, in my view, underscores the fact that nothing has really changed at Hanford. And that's what we've got to turn around. And uh, I will just say to the chair and Senator Johnson, my staff wrote this really long address. I think I can maybe spare you the uh, uh, full, uh, full filibuster and just thank you very much for what, you, what, what, what you're doing. This is important for our part of the world. But it is important because all over the country at other sites are being followed. And employees are saying, what are the consequences of coming forward and speaking the truth to influential policymakers? So I thank you very much uh, uh, for your work. If, uh, if you, uh, as Chair Senator McCaskill, have any questions, softball questions are especially welcome. But I better get uh, back uh, pretty quick to finance. Uh, committee deliberations, and I just thank you very Absolutely. much for doing it. Absolutely. Thanks for coming, Ron. Th thank you. Thank you, Ron. Dr. Thank Thomasitis. The retaliation against me started after I raised technical issues that had nuclear safety implications. My concern centered, ar centered around the buildup of hydrogen gas, which could cause a hydrogen explosion, the buildup of plutonium and the bottom of the tanks, which could cause a criticality and the plugging of pipelines, which could render the plant inoperable for years. The issues I raised not only had nuclear safety implications, but could have major impacts on the plant design. And I believe that is the root of the problem. The issues stood in the way of Bechtel and URS earning their award fees, and of more importance, getting additional funding from Congress. The problem of the WTP, I would offer, is not the complexity of the process or actually how the process should operate. There are many good people at Hanford that are working very hard on it. The problem is the mismanagement. The management's objective, the contractor's objective, is to keep the project moving and get their funding, whether they're moving backwards, moving forwards, or standing still. As long as they're there, they get their funds. The concerns I raised to my firing from the WTP by Bechtel. I want to say that this issue is much bigger than me. And I don't want the, the issue to be judged solely by my input. By firing me, putting me in the basement, and then releasing me, uh, URS firing me, both Bechtel and URS are sending a clear message to all employees don't do what Walt did. And from what I hear from people calling me, talking to people, they're doing a doggone good job of getting that message out. URS claims they laid me off for downsizing reasons. I can tell you that I see no difference in how I was handled when I was fired from the WTP by Bechtel versus being, quote, laid off by URS. And URS held my severance pay hostage for me to give them legal immunity and we are talking a significant amount of money. 
I did not sign the agreement to give them legal immunity, so I foregoed my severance pay. I consider the withholding of my severance pay by URS to be akin to extortion. With the contractors focus on profits, the employees receive punitive treatment if, and retaliation if they raise safety issues because it could impact the plant. The contractors then, if they cannot blame DOE, bear the cost of their repairs. Their performance decreases, cost and schedule performance. And there's nothing wrong with making money. I mean, the companies need to make money. That's the way our, our system is built. But when the focus on profits trumps safety, new quality, and building, doing the right thing, you have a problem. And I would submit that you have a major problem in the WTP when the cost goes from an initial estimate by Bechtel of $4.6 billion, and today the estimate would be over $25 billion or higher. The startup was going to be in seven years, 01 to 08, and now the startup won't, is talked about being in the late 2020s. I mean, the plan would have been further ahead, closer to startup, if they'd have done nothing. They'd been only seven years from startup with 01 to 08. But nothing gets done with the contractors despite that abuse because they continue to get the funding, lobby Congress for additional money, and they continue to get their funding and stay there. Their objective is to keep the funding coming. The contractors, especially Bechtel, will use intimidation and pressure to get the answer they want. This is evidenced by the information we found in their dealings with the Savannah River National Lab. They also put tremendous pressure on Battelle and the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Their CEO, uh, the uh, of Bechtel Corporate leaned on Dr. Wadsworth ethics prevented them from doing that. To make matters worse, the government funding and supporting these contractor actions. Now is the time, in my mind, for Congress to make changes. All the companies in the DOE system are watching to see what happens. With the visibility of my case, Donna's case, the cost, cost growth, the schedule overrun, it will be Katie bar to door if no action is taken to rein the contractors in. As an example of how Congress is funding the uh, contractor performance. All legal expenses incurred by Bechtel and URS to fight employee legal actions are reimbursed on an ongoing basis via taxpayer money. Then if the company is found guilty, they may be asked to pay back. Well, what do they do? They settle before they pay back. They're not found guilty, no payment. All their attorneys and the people that are here today will be reimbursed for their expenses to come here and that comes from taxpayer money. So what do they do? They, they have no incentive, the companies have no incentive to do the right thing. Let the employee file a concern. We'll drag the thing out. The government's paying us to fight them. They hire outside attorneys. The outside attorneys are paid by the hour. They have no incentive to settle quicker. So the system provokes, supports the contractors doing what they do and continuing to get paid. There's no incentive to do the right thing or to settle quicker. And guess who pays for the cost of us for our legal expenses? Us. Another problem in the WTP is that the Bechtel is the design agent and the design authority. That means they decide what they need to do and how they need to do it and then they're rewarded for cost and schedule performance. That's akin to giving the fox the hen house. I would even say it's worse. It's a license to steal, to keep the project going, to keep that funding stream going. And if somebody raises a technical issue and it could stand in the way of their funding, 
They're going to retaliate. They're going to take punitive action. And that's what happened with M3 back, or the mixing issue back in 2010, when not only was there a $5 million award fee on the line, but behind the scenes they were lobbying Congress for an extra $50 million, in which they got because they, quote, closed M3. But today, as Senator Wyden said, the Department of Energy's conducted surveys. They supported and found a negative culture. The Defense Board did an in-depth study and found and issued, uh, found issues and issued two recommendations. Outside groups have identified issues. And if you don't believe all that and say, you know, that's all kind of hoodoo, we don't believe all Walt, the Secretary of Energy, former Secretary Chu, shut the place down. So the problems are well known, but the contractors continue to get their funding because they misrepresent and mislabel the information. My termination occurred on the heels of Secretary Moniz issuing a statement for a harassment-free workplace. He issued that statement about the third week of September. I was fired by you, or laid off by U.S., quote, laid off. The, on October 2nd, less than two weeks after he issued that statement. Now, with the visibility of my case, several lawsuits, and Moniz issuing that statement, if URS would blatantly just lay me off, dismiss me, get rid of me, right after the secretary issues such a cultural statement, what does it say about what they would do if there was no statement? I mean, they will... If you stand in the way of their progress to keep the funding going, there are problems. And with that, I'll say, in my mind, the WTP and the DOE culture are at a tipping point. Now is the time to make a change. If no change is made, I feel real bad for the future generation of workers because I don't want anybody to go through what I've gone through. It's tough. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Carpenter. Thank you for inviting my comments today, uh, and thank both of you, uh, Senators, for supporting whistleblower rights. I know that you're strong advocates, and uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, and this hearing is uh, is a very welcome oversight on what's happening. Uh, my name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the Executive Director of Hanford Challenge. Our mission is the safe and effective cleanup of the Hanford site for uh, both present and future generations. Uh, we work with insiders. Uh, we hope they don't become whistleblowers uh, unless they need to tell the truth, but we don't want employees to become whistleblowers. These folks didn't want to become whistleblowers. Uh, they simply were doing their jobs, and that's the case for most people out there, and then suddenly they're finding themselves on the wrong side of their, their company. Um, we'd like to change that culture so that concerns are welcomed, uh, addressed uh, and and we move on and we have a better plan because of that. Um, it's the third anniversary of the Fukushima accident today uh, and I think it's fitting and appropriate that we're here talking about protecting uh, nuclear whistleblowers and talking about nuclear safety. Uh, at the Fukushima plant, um, engineers there uh, wanted to build and recommended the building of a higher tsunami wall. Uh, to protect the plan against uh, that event. And they also recommended that the uh, emergency diesel generators be moved from the floodplain to on the hill behind the plant. Uh, engineers tell us that the earthquake itself did not cause the Fukushima accident. It was the tsunami. Um, and so uh, because the utility that runs Fukushima didn't listen to and suppress the testimony of these engineers, about the tsunami effects, we have one of the worst nuclear accidents. It's still raging out of control. Uh, we still have three meltdowns in process there. Two spent fuel pools have uh, had hydrogen gas explosions, and there's 300,000 gallons a day of radioactive water pouring into the ocean. We can prevent that kind of thing happening in our own country at the Hanford site, but only if we listen to our experts. Uh, it's not just Donna Bushy. Uh, and Walt Tamasitis, who are both acknowledged experts with, with good degrees, with excellent degrees, uh, the top in their country. It's why they were recruited for these positions. You know, Donna being the manager of nuclear safety, 
Walt, the manager of research and technology, but you also have on record uh, the chief engineer uh, of the facility, a guy named Gary Brunson, who recommended the sh shutdown of the waste treatment plant until the safety issues are resol uh, resolved. That did not happen. Uh, he resigned in protest. Um, you also have Don Alexander, uh, the chief scientist for the facility, raising safety concerns, going to USA Today, and, and trying to find some avenue. Um, and eventually, these folks did get through to Secretary Chu, uh, the former energy secretary. Uh, he listened to their concerns, uh, and that resulted in, in the suspension of all nuclear work um, at, at the plant. And it's, that's been that way for a year and a half, and it remains that way. And we, we're grateful that that's happening. However, it could have been earlier. It could have been years ago when these folks were listened to. And right now, our major concern is that the treatment of these folks and others like them have sent a message throughout the safety culture uh, that it's not safe to raise an issue. Uh, that's a message that cannot be allowed to stand. Uh, and it's really up to the Department of Energy uh, to make sure that that message uh, is countered. Uh, because right now, we see that Bechtel and URS uh, are winning the battle to silence employees out there. Um, and uh, they're, People who are younger in their careers, who see a safety issue, uh, they need to be encouraged uh, to raise those concerns, and the system does not tolerate that right now. Uh, so we're asking that um, Congress take some action to subject DOE to some independent oversight for nuclear safety. Uh, we've been doing this now for, for 25 years, trying to get the Department of Energy to take steps to protect whistleblowers and to have a better nuclear safety culture out there. It's not working. They're not going to. Um, there needs to be independent oversight uh, for nuclear safety and for the safety culture at the site. So we'd like to ask Congress to consider taking some steps in that direction. In the practice of reimbursing attorney's fees, the public shouldn't be reimbursing what amounts to illegal retaliation against whistleblowers out there. It's not in their interest. It's in the interest of the public to hear the safety concerns, not suppress and silence them. So I'm hoping this committee also takes on that, that challenge. Um, and we're also looking for meaningful remedies and protections for whistleblowers. Right now, there's really not much there um, to avail uh, for these folks to avail themselves of protection. Uh, thank you very much for considering my statement today, and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, let me start with asking, was there ever any issue, documented issue, on your job performance, either one of you, prior to you saying things out loud and publicly that raised safety concerns concerning Hanford? Um, I'll, you want me to start off? I, I received three letters. The first one was titled Corrective Action Letter, where in summary it told me to be nicer to people. Um, there was, it wasn't written as a written warning it, from a standard human resource perspective. It was just titled um, Corrective Action Letter. Um, that was in 2011. I received nothing until 2013. So there was a silence between 2011 and 2013. I received another letter that said I was basically late on assignments, um, and it listed four of those. And then the final letter was um, I it sent inappropriate emails um, when I requested human resources, had they done an investigation to, because an email by itself, without the context of the conversation, is just an email by itself. And my supervisor and the manager of human resources admitted, oh, this was just based on the emails. And those were the three letters I received. And did, when those occurred before you, did those, uh, I'm trying to figure out where the performance issues with you, if they, if there were any that were documented prior to you giving testimony in a no. public way that they didn't like. No. Pri prior, prior to that, I would say I received above average um, raises, um, very good bonuses from the executive compensation pool, um, had received numerous letters of, you know, thank yous from my supervisors. Until so it wasn't until you gave answers that made the companies uncomfortable, that was when you first started receiving some kind of documentation about your job performance? Yes, ma'am. And what about you, Dr. Timis? Was there anything prior to you raising concerns about technical issues of safety at Hanford, had you gotten any performance issues um, brought to your attention prior to that? No, ma'am, not at all. Okay. Um, 
how long did you work there prior to you raising concerns publicly that the, 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 the contractors disagreed with? I would say probably 14, 15 months. I started in March of 2009. Um, the fortuitous meeting was July of 2010, or the la la latter part of June 2010. Um, up before that, I received, you know, really no negative, lots of accolades that I was doing great work at the waste treatment plant. Um, when you, um, was there ever a time that you felt pressure to change anything you had written or testified to by the companies? Yes, ma'am. And, and would you delineate what those were and when? In the public meeting um, convened by the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, I think it was October 7th and 8th um, of 2010, I was requested to sit on the panel. Um, during the second panel discussion, which was the first day, uh, was really the controversial where I took positions technically. Um, immediately after that, I was admonished by, at that time, EM1 and as Dr. Trier. And well, explain what EM1, what, what it is. Environmental management. So okay. in the Department of Energy, environmental management is really the government part that, that flow down of who is overseeing the cleanup of Hanford. Um, so after that particular meeting, when I walked into the debrief room, you know, you're shuttled back and forth. Um, I made it made a comment that I was out looking for a gentleman because I figured I was off his Christmas card list so I was trying to relieve tension um, and I was admonished uh, that if my intent was to piss people off I did a mighty fine job that day so I left the room the next morning I chose not to go back there because it was quite you know 40 people not being kind um, I was met outside by Frank Russo Leo Sane and Bill Gay requesting me so Frank Russo was Bechtel um, Leo Sane and Bill Gay were URS requesting me to change my testimony and I told them I could not and I went and you know basically went inside during the actual third panel session Shirley Olinger from the Department of Energy was actually passing cards to Leo Sane with handwritten notes to change the testimony that I had given. So, so it was Bechtel, URS, and the Department of Energy that were putting pressure on you to change what you were saying publicly? Yes, ma'am. And what about you? There are, there are several very distinct cases. Uh, I started raising issues when I got there in 2003 because that was my job responsibility. In 2006, uh, I chaired a, led a very intensive uh, technical review chartered by Secretary Bodman at that time, Secretary of Energy Bodman. Uh, upon issuing that report, a Bechtel manager, Craig Albert, called me and said he wanted to edit the report. And I said, no, as you know, that those were the ground rules, those were included in the ground rules, that there would be no editing by management of the report. He said to me, who do you work for? And I said, well, you know, I think I know who I work for. He then went on to say, well, I've talked with Jim Owendorf at DOE, and Jim Owendorf said it's okay. And I said, well, if it's okay, I'll call Mr. Owendorf and confirm it. And he then recanted his story. And the, the pressure then began retaliation on me from 06. In 2010, there were many times when my US, URS manager, Bill Gay, took me aside and said, quit raising issues. Don't raise the issues. Leo Sane, the vice president in Aiken, South Carolina, told me, bring, well, bring the issues to me and I'll take them up the line. And I said, Leo, you're in Aiken. I'm 3,000 miles away. My job is to do that. No, no, you bring the issues to me and I'll handle them. Then at the end of June 2010, I tasked PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Lab, to issue a report and my immediate two URS uh, bosses, Bill Gay and Richard Edwards, both tried to have that report squashed because they knew that that report would conflict with Bechtel's approach to the a uh, technical resolution of the problem. So I've had of many of the mixing problem. Yes, Senator. Okay. Um, uh, finally, and, and I want Senator Johnson to have an opportunity to ask you some questions, and I may have a couple more. Um, in your, you've already said that they wouldn't give you your severance pay unless you sign documents resolving, uh, absolving them of any legal liability uh, surrounding the way that you were treated. Um, on your non-disclosure agreements, was it clear in your non-disclosure agreements 
that they had no legal authority to keep you from doing what you're doing today, uh, making reports to either inspector generals or to Congress in, 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 as a whistleblower. Was, was that clear in the non-disclosure agreements that you retained those rights? Do you mean when we signed on with the company? Right. Wow. Uh, I would say I do not remember any such verbal or written statement. And since the time I filed suit in the past, over the past almost four years, I have never heard that referred to. Okay. So I don't know anything about it. No, I, I would say the non-disclosure, because I've, I've read it numerous times, I would say is not, would not supersede some of the department's regulations to, to provide factually accurate information. So when a defense nuclear facility safety board, whether an attorney or a board member would ask me a question, I believe I'm obligated to tell the truth. Senator Johnson. Okay. You know, I come at this from a perspective of a business guy who's managed construction projects mm -hmm. in the past, and there's a lot of things that I just, this is a real head scratcher, never, never, uh, from a number of different perspectives. I mean, first of all, I'm not sure in terms of the, obviously we have a dis dispute between yourself and the, and the company. I'm not sure this is the best place to adjudicate this. This will be done through a court of law. And I think there's some real issues in terms of whistleblower protection and, and who's getting reimbursed for legal fees and who's not. I think those are very legitimate issues. Um, but, you know, as, as a business guy, I avoided attorneys, no offense, and, and the le and judicial process like a plague. Mm -hmm. And, you know, taking this kind of action, both Bechtel and URS would certainly understand that this is going to be create an awful lot of heat. So, again, I, putting that aside, w what I want to get to is, again, having managed construction projects, ha having been a customer, uh, it's always the, uh, it, it's, it's, now, I mean, having been a customer and a supplier, it's always the customer that's in the driver's seat here, and the customer in this instance is, is the government. So, so let me start, because I, I read in part of the briefing that uh, the companies are required to notify the government if they're going to be laying off or dismissing a safety employee or, or somebody in that safety it, function. It's key, per key personnel on the contract. Okay, so mm -hmm. were you one of those key persons? Yeah, yes, I am, and as of yesterday, I'm still listed in the Bechtel contract as key personnel. Okay, so what were, were those notifications given? Um, there was a letter, to my knowledge, I, I won't speculate, but I do know that Bechtel sent a letter January 14th to the Department of Energy requesting to change key personnel. Um, that, la that letter has been labeled sensitive in the system, so, I, you know, there's a lot of gossip, so people brought it to my attention. Um, I could not get a copy. Um, my understanding is the Department of Energy did not approve that or the significant reorganization of of my, my, my job department at that time. So today, I don't believe that they've actually made a decision one way or another, and I'm still listed in the contract. Again, I think the gov government should be in the driver's seat of, of pressing safety and, and making sure and putting controls in place to make sure, you know, things like that, you know, the, the, yes. you know that, that type of system should be, should be honored and respected and followed. Mm -hmm. What other things are, are there that the government has in place to be in, in charge of this process that, that they may be just ignoring that they're not, they're not following through on. Does that make sense? Do you know uh, well, what I'm trying well, to get at? I think so. I think I would answer that, in my view, the Department of Energy is outnumbered, outmanned, and outgunned when it comes to deal with the contractors. At the WTP, it's about 100, if not 150 to 1, the ratio of contractor employees to DOE oversight. DOE has to rely on the contractor for what the technical situation is. And when I was in the, as R&T manager, there was not one engineer in the DOE chain between my counterpart and Secretary Chu. I mean, all good degrees, but a law degree is not going to necessarily help with the design of the WTP. So they, the DOE has to rely on the contractors. The contractors now want to keep their funding going. So they will mislead, misrepresent the facts, and I'll say sell a story to DOE. But again, that, that gets to the point that the government has to put in place the controls, recognizing the limited nature of their personnel versus the personnel of the contractors. And I remember you know, the hearing we did have on this, that was a question I had is, you know, could, could we? You know, do, could the government hire the people to do this type of project? And, and really the answer is, I mean, no way. So the government has to rely on these contractors to have expertise in, in producing these one-of-a-time, 
you know, once in the, in the span of human history, these types of projects, you have to rely on contractors, but it's a matter of how do you institute the controls that ensure the safety that protect whistleblowers, you know, so Mr. Carp, yeah, so. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, on to that. Uh, you know, we do have models in this country for regulating nuclear uh, energy and the nuclear Navy both have programs for uh, instituting safety culture and making sure that the, uh, the laws are followed. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there is an element of independence there. Um, and that is what is missing at the Department of Energy and the Hanford site, for instance, is uh, the Department of Energy owns the site. Uh, they're subject to pressure from you guys, from the state of Washington and from other stakeholders to hurry up and get it done. Um, that, that's, just, that's justifiable pressure, right? I mean, it is every, justifiable every, every, you know, pressure because you know, I was, I was, you know, we're already getting leaking the aquifer. I mean, this is this Absolutely. is a big, yeah. complex problem. No right? question about that. However, you do have the nuclear safety laws, and if you take shortcuts there to yeah. hurry up on the schedule, then you've got a problem. But l l let me, because I talked about difference of opinion. You, you mentioned Fukushima. I was, I was just speaking to somebody, and again, I'm not a nuclear engineer. But one of the lessons learned, you, you said the experts said increase the, the walls to protect the diesel generators. The design change that's going to be made as a result of that experience is put a big old tank of water on top of the nuclear reactor that can cool it and can be filled by anything. I mean, you can get, you can get outside pumps to fill that. So the outside experts at that point, not having that experience, would have recommended raising walls, not the best design solution to that. The best design solution is to put a big old tank of water. So, I mean, it is true that you've, you've got differences of opinion of the best way to proceed in, in pretty complex en engineering. So, yeah, I, would just, I want to go back, I think, to your original question that, yes, do I believe that the Department of Energy is ultimately responsible and accountable for the safe cleanup of Hanford? Absolutely. Well, and it has to be. A absolutely. So I have, no, I have no argument there. But I also believe that the contractors, primarily Bechtel and URS, who have signed written agreements and contracts with the Department of Energy, are obligated to tell the truth. Well, to follow so, those contracts. I mean, I, correct. I, I, I did, right. I so that's there. the business side. So, 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 so what, what, are, what are they? What parts of those contracts are they violating? So when it, it is, it's a fundamental under 10 CFR 820.11 that any documentation provided to the government be factual in all material respects. So when the department, I mean, excuse me, when Bechtel and URS exclude even what those differing opinions, people are making an uninformed decision on incomplete facts. That directly relies with the contractor. So if Donna Bushy is no longer allowed to go to the senior management meetings with the Department of Energy, all they're hearing is, we're good to go. There are no differing professional opinions. It's all solved. And is it a complex problem? Yes. But it's not as complex as people would make it out to be. We vitrify waste all over the world. We're building two vitrification facilities and a laboratory. Those are standard technologies, but yet there are still, still systemic design flaws because we haven't addressed technical issues as they are raised. You know, at some point in time, mm -hmm. in the construct, people have to make decisions. Correct. They have to make decisions on, on basically alternate approaches, alternate technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those always had to be reviewed and updated, and you know, was it the right decision? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it. it at a certain point in time, it becomes management quandary going, okay, well, we got to make a decision. We have to move forward on this. And, and you can have, and I'm not saying, mm -hmm. you can have people with potentially off the wall mm -hmm. different ideas on things. I mean, at what point do you say, well, no, this is a decision we made in, in conjunction with the government. We're moving forward on this. And, and, you're, you're, and you, know, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That, that, that's the question. You know, there's absolutely. the quandary. That's the conundrum here. Remember, well, I would. I, Hang on just one second. Well, I, I was an executive, so I do get the business and the profit and loss piece. I clearly understand that. But we made those risks from the year 2003 to 2010. Those risks were taken. Management made those decisions, and they turned out to be technically wrong. So we have six-foot concrete walls with commodities in the walls, ventilation. Again, so my, my question is, why isn't the Department of Energy, why, why aren't sh they're the ones that should be saying this was wrong, we got to move forward. And, and quite honestly, because it's, it's, a, it's a work in process, no, nobody knows for sure. I mean, from, no, I, from, from standpoint of business, you go, okay, well, we all collectively made the decision. It was a wrong decision. Now we got to change it. It's going to cost more money. I mean, we're, we're not going to like that. Dollars are scarce, but, but it's... So, so you've got all these competing pressures making it pretty difficult to 
decide exactly how to move forward. I believe the Department of Energy has stood down construction and a large port of production engineering on pre-treat and HLW for the very reasons that we and many other people raised, right? The question is, how do you go forward? If you use the same business management models that make the same business decisions using the same process and the same people, we're going to end up 10 years from now having the next discussion at $25 billion. So again, that, again, putting mm -hmm. your specific situation mm -hmm. aside, which should be adjudicated in a court of law, sure. which is the appropriate venue. From our standpoint, what do we need to do, considered legislatively, mm -hmm. to solve it? I mean, how, how should the Department of Energy, as the customer, how do they institute the controls? What do we need to put into, in, into the controls so this is a, a process that is going to move forward, be as cost effective as possible, um, but also proceed in a, in a timely manner, mm -hmm. quickly, as, as quickly as possible, but also in a safe manner? Well, first, let me, let me offer that with the design of the WTP. Bechtel designed the Savannah River vitrification plant. They operate it. URS operates it. URS operated the West Valley vitrification plant, and URS is operating Sellafield, England. Those two companies well know how to build a plant. The problem is that they do not come forward and say, here's what we're going to do. Let us tell you what we're going to do, what we're going to be. Let us give us the, give you the, tell you what this plant will do, what we're going to provide you as the customer, Department of Energy. They don't do that. They let, let me just say, are there differences between these sites? I mean, there are, aren't there? I mean, it, the no, no, no. It's, it's nuclear waste with every element of the periodic table in it being put in the glass. So, so again, why didn't the government, why didn't the Department of Energy say, hey, listen, you've already got these. Just give us a quote on, on this exact same process. We've, we've already over overcome these technical hurdles at these other sites. Why are we reinventing the wheel here? This worked. I mean, again, the customer should be driving this process. They should be in charge. I would, I would concur that the Department of Energy plays a role in establishing those requirements. But again, they don't have the technical background. If Why that, not? Good question. I would suggest that you need, as Congress, to give the D Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board some authority to assure that the designs are compliant with the nuclear laws. That's what's missing here, is that driver. Uh, when you, uh, they're in conflict. The GAO has done this study. The Army Corps of Engineers has done these studies. They have identified mismanagement, incompetence, et cetera, et cetera, but mostly they identify conflict of interest. Now, if you beef up the role of an agency that's already there doing this work but doesn't have the authority to, for instance, grant a license, then you've got a problem. Now, you make that so, uh, you make sure that it's a safe design and DOE can continue being DOE. The contractors do what they have to do, but they have to do it with nuclear safety in mind, and that is going to improve the schedule and the cost. So that only assumes that the government agencies have the expertise that is they do. at least as good they as, do. as the contractors have. They do. The Defense Nuclear Facility Board has retired nuclear engineers from the contractor community, from the NRC, from the nuclear navy. Uh, this is an excellent okay, agency. Why, why has the government instituted the types of controls that's necessary here to ensure safety? Good question. We've been asking for that for well, some we'll, time, and we'd answer. love you to do that. We'd but love you. Uh, I mean, that's so what, that's at, at the now, I'll turn it yeah. But that's a statutory issue. Right. Precisely. Well, that's, that's, what we've, that's what we should get decided on in, you know, this press, you know, whatever this is, this meeting, which I appreciate, and, and in hearings and subsequent hearings, we've got to get to the point of, What's the solution? What are the controls? I mean, what do we need to do from a government standpoint who really should be in charge of this process since those types of You're controls singing to, my to, song. Solve, to solve the problem I love that. as well as you know, provide the controls? Absolutely. But, but for the purpose of whistleblowers, we need a forum that we can actually raise concerns. Individuals like myself and Dr. Walter Tamasitis have an incredible amount of courage that some days I don't know how I went to work, right? Mm -hmm. But when you see very strong people that are treated the way we are, and it's, it's a deafening silence when they have no form to actually raise those concerns. And there is no check and balance in the system now. So with respect to whistleblower reform, I think we have a lot of work that we need to do so that, one, we can raise concerns and that they're not just have to be adjudicated in a court of law for six to seven years while very legitimate safety issues may be under. And I might add, adjudicated in a court of law for six or seven years with the taxpayers picking up an unfettered bill of millions yeah. of dollars for legal fees yes. while they are scraping to figure out how they can actually outweigh no, I mean, the, the, the paper barrage and, and that will come down on their head 
from private defense firms who know the more they work it, the more money they make. Their incentive is to bill, depose, bill, delay, depose, bill, 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 delay, depose. So the notion that this is somehow a level playing field is ridiculous. But, but it should be because the adjudication process, really in terms of whistleblower protection, should reside, from my standpoint, the Department of Energy. They're the ones that have the charge with safety, making sure that those controls are in place. And you should be able to go to the Department of Energy, speak freely. Again, from my standpoint, the companies having laid you off have taken a, a, pretty, a pretty big legal risk. You know, and, and we'll find out how that all, all plays out. But the process really has to be, and, and the control's got to be within a governmental agency, which always gives me pause because we, we see they're not particularly... I did, I did go to the Employee Concerns Program in DOE, and when the manager listened to my case, he said, he told me this was above the ability of his group and I should go to somebody on the outside. But we have to be talking about. I mean, that's, right. that's what this is. Well, then I'm just encouraged to hear that you're ready to increase appropriations to the Department of Energy to hire engineers. I'm, I'm happy to look at priority and spending. That surprises me. <laughs> Prior, that surprises and, me and, that, and, that you would be willing uh, to, Department to of Energy, if, if we can enhance government here and not solely rely on the private sector, as especially when they're all the incentives, financial and otherwise, are to not slow down the process for technical concerns, to not allow the technical concerns that are being raised to get the same prominence in their reports to DOE as their version of what needs to occur. So I, I think that there is a real issue here in terms of empowering DOE so that they can, in fact, be a real player at the table. They don't have that power right now because they don't have the manpower, they don't have the expertise, and they don't have the resources. This, this is a priority of government. Who else is going to do this? This is a big mess. It's got to be cleaned up. We've got to look at some lower priority okay, items that we, that, that, we don't, that, we don't, that we don't have to spend so money you on. So okay? you will co-sponsor a bill with me to increase appropriations as to the as Department long, of Energy? As long as we find where See, the, last time I looked, where, I thought you wanted to do away where, with the Department of Energy. Where's the lower items, where's the lower priority spending items that we offset for that you know, for the higher priority spending, which is... I, I'm fine with that. I, I just think, and maybe yeah, it's not... Yeah, there's some bipartisanship here. Maybe right it's not DOE. <laughs> maybe about, it is the nuclear board that you re referenced. How about the bonuses and uh, fee for some of the contractors that haven't performed very well out well, there? Well, that's an old refrain that we have covered I, I many think times in the subcommittee. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I think certainly one step forward would be Congress setting the standard, empowering DOE, telling them that the yes. performance is unacceptable, DOE is, is, I mean, they're in operation. They want to move ahead. A lot of pressure on them for schedule, cost. They listen to the contractors. You get into a cycle. The cycle can slowly degrade. It's degraded now. Congress reinforcing the DOE that the, the performance is unacceptable. And here are things that need to change. Just that, I believe, would make a big step. I have advocated for the Defense Board to be given enforcement authority so that when they issue a recommendation, as Mr. Carpenter said, they could also enforce it. Steps like that would help. Let me, just, let me just throw one caveat out there, because I was a business guy that just didn't do business with the government because it wasn't worth it. And you're taking a look at it right here. There aren't many co companies in the world that could handle this. Uh, we've got to make sure that those, we've got some people that are willing to do this type of work. So it's got, it's got to be fair from all sides, but we've got to institute the safety controls to ensure it proceeds in a safe and effective manner. We will um, look forward to any more information you want to submit for the record. Um, and we will begin the formal hearing in just a few minutes and certainly would um, appreciate your input after hearing the formal hearing. And we've got a couple of to-do items that I think might really help that Senator Johnson and I can agree on. And I think it, from empowering uh, DOE, but also to looking at having this outside third already very, you know, everyone respects this board. Everyone knows they know this very technical area. Giving them some third-party oversight with the ability to, to make some pronouncements in this area, I think, make a lot of sense. Uh, there is a lot of private companies that deal with this board now mm -hmm. in, that, in that context, and there's no reason why this facility shouldn't be also one of them. Okay, yeah. thank you all very thank much. You. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank
Now, Energy Department officials and company executives testify about safety at the Hanford Waste Treatment Site before the full contracting oversight panel. Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri is the chair. And we're going to ask the Department of Energy to come up first. They, they, they are, um, do not want to be at the same table with you today. I don't really understand why, but we're going to have them come up first. Who is the person from the Department of Energy? Who is the person from the Department of Energy that is testifying? Hello? I'll give my opening statement. Hopefully they will have shown up by then. This hearing will now come to order. The waste treatment plant is a federal nuclear facility in Hanford, Washington that is supposed to convert hazardous, highly radioactive nuclear waste into a more stable and safe form for permanent disposal. Last June, I held a hearing on contract management by the Department of Energy, which looks specifically at the, at the WTP, the waste treatment plant at Hanford, because the plant, which is under a design and construction con construct in terms of how the contracts were given, has a litany of cost overruns and schedule delays. Today, however, we are here to examine another aspect of the plant. Allegations that the Department of Energy and its contractors, Bechtel and URS, are engaging in retaliation against employees who raise concerns about the safety of the plant's design and construction. The Department of Energy has a specific nuclear safety policy that states, quote, it is the policy of the Department of Energy to design, construct, operate and decommission its nuclear facilities in a manner that ensures adequate protection of workers, the public, and the environment. However, federal agencies that have looked at safety issues at Hanford have repeatedly found key safety-related weaknesses, including the lack of quality assurance, safety culture, and federal oversight. Most recently, URS Manager of Environment Nuclear Safety, Donna Bush Bushy, has alleged that she was fired because she raised concerns that basic nuclear safety fundamentals had not been considered from the beginning of construction. Another official associated with the waste treatment plant, the manager of waste treatment plant research and technology, Dr. Walter Tomasidis, who testified before the subcommittee in 2011, also claims to have suffered professional damage, including termination after raising major, major nuclear safety issues. These individuals, and many more who have chosen to remain anonymous, have brought their concerns forward to their employers, to DOE, and to Congress. I don't think anyone wants to be a whistleblower. Reporting your colleagues, who may be your friends, for actions that look like waste, fraud, abuse, or a danger to others isn't an easy decision for most people. After life, and life after you've blown the whistle isn't easy either. But the job that whistleblowers do is tremendously important and value, valuable. That's why when courageous men and women feel compelled to speak out, we do not want to silence them. We want to give them a process that allows them to report that information without fear of retaliation. Before this hearing began, I took the opportunity to hear from Ms. Bushy and Dr. Temesidis. I also heard from Mr. Carpenter, who represents many more whistleblowers through his work at Hanford Challenge. They describe an atmosphere which they and other individuals face severe retaliation for raising concerns about Hanford. Whether Ms. Bushy or Dr. Temesidis or any of the other individuals that have come forward to this subcommittee is right about the science behind the safety at Hanford is not a matter on which I or the people in the room at this hearing today will be able to reach a final conclusion about. But the fact that Ms. Bushy and Dr. Temesidis were fired, despite being known to have raised their concerns, has created the appearance of a chilled atmosphere to safety and the belief of employees that management suppresses technical dissent. That demands attention by Congress, and it certainly demands attention by the people who have oversight over this project. Today, we will hear from two witnesses from the Department of Energy with responsibility for the safety culture at Hanford. We will also hear from Bechtel, the prime contractor at the waste treatment plant, and URS, a subcontractor to Bechtel, who is the employer of both Dr. Bushy and Dr. Temesidis. I thank the witnesses for being here and look forward to their testimony. And we will begin with uh, Mr. Eckrode and Mr. Morey. Um, and I will introduce both of you, and you can take your oath. Mr. Eck and the reason I'm a little 
frantic is that we're going to start votes at 1130, which is really going to mess this up. And this is going to prolong the hearing in a way that didn't seem efficient to me. And since this is a subcommittee about efficiency and effectiveness in government, it is hard for me to accommodate what seems to me an antiquated notion that members of the government can't sit at the same table with contractors. That is flies in the face of the reality that our government is filled with contractors working side by side, sometimes undistinguishable from each other in terms of their work function and what they're doing. The notion that we have to have two tables to make sure the government people don't have to intermix with the company people um, seems to be a, some, somebody holding on to some notion that makes no sense in terms of today's government and its operation. But I know you two are not responsible for that decision, so I won't yell at you. I will save my wrath for the person who actually made that decision, which will come at a later time. Uh, Mr. Eckrode is Deputy Chief of Operations, Office of Health, Safety, and Security at the U.S. Department of Energy. Mr. Eckrode previously served as Principal Deputy Chief for Mission Support Activities in the Office of Health, Safety, and Security and Director of the Office of Independent Oversight. Matt Morey is Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety, Security, and Quality Programs, Environmental Management at the U.S. Department of Energy, where he executes operational safety and awareness programs and oversees quality assurance programs. Mr. Morey previously spent almost 20 years at the Defense Nuclear Safety Facility Safety Board, which we referenced earlier, uh, where he led the board's effort to ensure the Department of Energy nuclear stockpile and defense nuclear research operations met health and safety standards. Thank you both for being here. It is this, the custom of the subcommittee to swear all witnesses. If you would stand. Do you swear that the testimony that you're about to give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you both. And we will begin with you, Mr. Eckrod. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, I hope? Uh, yes, Madam Chairman, you are. Thank you. Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony regarding safety culture <clears throat> and related issues at the Department of Energy's Hanford Site Waste Treatment and Immobilization Plan, or WTP. I'd like to take a brief moment to describe the unique role of the Independent Oversight Program within the Office of Health, Safety, and Security, which has conducted safety culture reviews at Hanford and elsewhere. The mission of this program is to provide DOE line management, Congress, and other stakeholders with an independent evaluation of the effectiveness of DOE policy and line management performance and safety and security. This mission is accomplished by conducting performance-based assessments to design to verify the department's security interests are protected, that the department can effectively respond to emergencies, and the department's operations are conducted in a manner that protects its employees, the public, and the environment. Our team has completed two safety culture assessments at WTP, one in 2010 and one in 2012. These assessments included interviews with employees of the Office of River Protection, or ORP, and the contractor Bechtel National Incorporated, as well as a detailed review of their safety programs, processes, and procedures. Detailed reports of these assessments and the recommendations have been provided to the committee, and I will summarize their findings briefly. In 2010 assessment, we found that most personnel who were interviewed expressed that their managers encouraged a questioning attitude and that they were comfortable with raising safety concerns. However, some individuals believed that there was a chilled environment that discouraged reporting of safety concerns, and some BNI employees expressed fear about retaliation. Our report contained a number of detailed recommendations for both ORP and BNI. Among those recommendations were that BNI strengthen procedures for the resolution of nuclear safety concerns, identify mechanisms to strengthen trust among the workforce, and better communicate information to employees. Two years later, in 2012, we performed a second comprehensive assessment to measure the state of safety culture at WTP. For this assessment, we engaged in external independent experts with extensive experience in safety culture reviews to complement the highly experienced nuclear safety expertise in our staff. That helped us more effectively diagnose the safety culture and attributes uh, of WTP and learn things we didn't learn in, in our 2010 assessment. In 2012, we found that most personnel at WTP believed that safety was a high priority. However, a significant number of federal and contractor staff expressed reluctance to raise safety or quality concerns. Fear of retaliation was identified in some BNI groups. Employee willingness to raise safety concerns without fear of retaliation is an essential element of a healthy safety culture. Our conclusion was that significant management attention was needed to improve safety culture at WTP. 
We found that while managers expel support for a healthy nuclear safety culture, they did not have a full appreciation of the current culture or the nature and level of effort needed to foster a healthy safety culture. We, had, we are currently conducting a follow-up assessment of safety culture at WTP, our third review. That review will be completed this spring and a written report presented to management. We look forward to sharing this, the results of that assessment with the committee when it's complete. A strong safety culture starts with strong, ongoing support by the most senior leaders of the organization. I want to assure the members of the subcommittee that this is a very high priority for Secretary Moniz and Deputy Secretary Poneman. With the permission of the subcommittee, I'd like to introduce for the record a copy of a September 20, 2013 memorandum signed by both the Secretary and Deputy titled Personnel Commitment to Health and Safety Through Leadership, Employee Engagement, and Organizational Learning. The memorandum provides a visionary leadership and a deep personal commitment to building an organization we can all be proud to work in. A vibrant and healthy organizational culture will help the department to achieve its national security, scientific, and environmental uh, missions safely and secure securely. We're committed to helping the department to achieve this goal. Be glad to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much. Good morning. Well, good morning. Thank you, Chairman McCaskill, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. I'm here today to discuss the Department of Energy's efforts to improve workplace safety culture. In the interest of time, with your permission, I'd like to give a brief summary of my testimony and then submit my full testimony for the record. Creating and maintaining a robust safety culture, including a workplace where all employees feel free to raise concerns, is essential to achieving our mission at the Hanford site in Washington State and across the DOE complex. As you mentioned earlier, in terms of my background, I'm an engineer by training and have 30 years of experience in the nuclear field, including almost 20 years at the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. I also began my career as a nuclear trained submarine officer and recently retired with the rank of captain in the Navy Reserves. I have spent much of my career working to ensure adequate protection of the health and safety of the workers and the public. At DOE, my office executes operational safety and awareness programs. At DOE, we believe safety culture is best described as an organization's values and behaviors that are modeled by its leaders, internalized by its members, and serves to make the safe performance of work the overriding priority to protect the workers, the public, and the environment. Improving safety culture across the department remains a top priority. In September of last year, as Mr. Eckrode mentioned, the Secretary and Deputy Secretary of Energy reaffirmed their commitment to health and safety in a memorandum to all employees. The memo recognized that DOE can advance its challenging missions only if it provides all employees a safe and healthy work environment and fosters a culture in which workers at all levels are empowered to raise problems, participate in the development of solutions, and are engaged appropriately in decisions that affect their work. In addition, DOE has, DOE has taken actions to improve safety culture at Hanford. Shortly after its confirmation, the Secretary of Energy traveled to the site to gain a firsthand understanding of the technical issues at the waste treatment plant. The Secretary continues to engage DOE senior leadership and employees to underscore the importance of a robust safety culture. In particular, the efforts taken over the last two years by DOE to improve safety culture at Hanford are extensive and varied. First, new, new leadership has been put in place. The new leadership has the qualifications, experience, and safety values to put the waste treatment plant on a sustainable path. Second, the department clarified formal roles and responsibilities for management in the waste treatment plant project execution plan which is the DOE document that communicates to the contractor project objectives and how they will be accomplished. The department also revised the waste treatment plant contract performance evaluation measurement plan to better balance the priorities and emphasize quality and safety culture elements. Third, DOE implemented a safety culture oversight process at the waste treatment plant. Senior management meets regularly with contractor management to formally review the contractor's progress in executing its safety culture improvement action plan. Likewise, senior headquarters managers meet with ORP managers to discuss their progress and the progress of their contractors. 
Fourth, the department designed training to assist in reinforcing a positive safety culture and engaged in an extensive effort to provide this training. Beginning in December 2011, a team of federal and contractor subject matter experts from across the department began to design, develop, and deliver a course on safety culture and provided that training to more than 1,800 of our senior federal and contractor leaders. Rules and slogans don't drive culture change. Leaders drive this change personally. Leader, leaders must recognize the message that their actions will convey to their employees. This course was designed to provide the tools necessary for leaders to improve our safety culture. Finally, the department is working to strengthen the avenues to address issues raised by contractor and federal employees. A comprehensive issues management system has been established at ORP to ensure that new and previously identified issues are addressed and tracked to closure. The department has also strengthened the Hanford Employee Concerns Program, hired a new employee concerns manager at Hanford, and continues to administer its differing professional opinion process both of which provide additional avenues for employees to raise issues. Madam Chairman, with respect to claims of whistleblower retaliation by contractors, let me be clear. DOE is strongly committed to a workplace where all workers, both federal and, and contractor employees, are free to speak out. They're free to voice concerns or lodge complaints without any fear of retaliation. Contractors are statutorily and contractually bound not to retaliate against employees for protected whistleblower conduct. While I cannot speak to the specifics of the claims under review, DOE was not asked to and did not approve Ms. Bushy's recent termination. This termination has raised questions about the potential of an improper reprisal for having raised health, safety, or other protected concerns. For this reason, the department has asked the Office of the Inspector General to review the circumstances surrounding the termination of Ms. Bushy. The department will take appropriate action based on the outcomes of any uh, IG investigation. In conclusion, while the department has undertaken a broad array of activities to improve its safety culture, there's still work to be done. Safety culture is a continuum, and we continue to move along this continuum as we strive to improve. We recognize this is an ongoing process, a journey, not a destination, and one which calls for continuous improvement. A safety culture built on these principles requires sustained effort by the department's leadership and senior managers. The department remains fully committed to this effort. Madam Chairman, this completes my comments. Uh, I would be happy to answer your questions at this time. Thank you both, and thank you both very much for being here. We appreciate it very much. I um, very rudely blew right past my colleague and friend, Senator Johnson's opening statement, so I'm going to defer my questions and allow him to go first in the spirit of bipartisan cooperation that we try to work on on this committee. N nothing rude about it. I took no offense. I, I know we're trying to hustle through this, so I appreciate you letting me ask some questions. Uh, Mr. Eckrode and Mr. Mori, uh, both of you are talking about studies, and processes and, you know, all, all kinds of, no offense, uh, bureaucratic gobbledygook. You know, what I want to get to is I, I want to find out what control is in place right now. What, 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 it, what you, you're the customer. You should be in control of this process. What should someone like Ms. Bushy do? What course of action should she be taking and what kind of protections are available to, to her in the Department of Energy currently? Mr. Morey. Uh, well, she should be, as I mentioned earlier, the department is fully committed to her being able to raise any issue that hey, what, what should appropriate. What was the first step she should have taken? Is there somebody in well, the Department well, of Energy, somebody at the site where somebody like Ms. Bush she could go to and then re really be able to speak very freely and kind of establish, hey, listen, I'm, I'm a whistleblower, I need some protection? Well, I mean, there are certainly a series of steps she can go through to elevate her concerns, first starting with her line organization, the people that, he work, that she works for. If she doesn't achieve satisfaction through them, I mean, clearly the, uh, the best position we would be in is if the department took those issues and a contractor took those issues, tracked them, worked them to closure, um, and communicated the closure of those issues. Okay, but that, that, that didn't happen. So if you're in a position of a whistleblower, so if that did not happen, you've got, you, end up, you end up having to go to the customer, the government, 
What system is in place right now to address that type of situation? Well, there are a number of different programs that are available. That well, there's a problem right there, a number of different programs. I mean, is there well, one specific approach that she should have taken? Is there somebody in the Department of Energy overse overseeing that contract that she could have gone to that everybody in, you know, from the contractor base knows that if I've got a serious safety concern, I go to this office right there to get this thing uh, taken care of? Well, the next step would be to go to the employee concerns program that is out at the waste treatment plant that is run by the Richland office. It's a combined employee concerns program. Uh, we've expended an incredible amount of time upgrading that program, as I mentioned earlier in my statement. So that would be the next, next step. Um, how she pursues her issues is really up to her. It's up to the individual. She can then take it to headquarters and go through the Department of Energy's uh, program, or she can go directly to the Department of Labor if she feels the need to raise her issues through those programs. Do you know that she availed herself of any of those programs? Um, I am not aware of her availing herself of the uh, Hanford Employee Concerns Program. I do know that she has used the Department of Labor's program, but other than that, I'd have to get back with you in more details. Okay, Mr. Eckro, do you, can you add anything to that? Uh, Ms. Bushy, in the, the last couple of years, has used the DOE Headquarters Employee Concerns Program a number of times. I'm familiar with a couple of different employee concerns that she has sent forward. Most, uh, most dealt with her concerns with uh, actions of her managers that appear to be retaliatory in nature but she did use the mechanisms that were available to her um, to share her concerns. And I was, I was aware of some of those as well as other managers in the Department of Energy. Now, is she, was she in a unique position in terms of safety on, on, you know, with, within the site where her management, those contractors had to, had to consult with the Department of Energy, the, the customer, prior to her dismissal? Is it, the department was not consulted, nor did but, we approve the termination of but Ms. Bush. But was she in a position where is according to the contract, according to the rules, uh, that she was supposed to, that, that the, the Department of Energy should have been notified prior to her dismissal? Well, I'm, I'm not an attorney. As I mentioned before, I, I am an engineer, not a contracting officer. Um, I am not aware that of the specifics of what was required uh, prior to URS terminating Ms. Bushy. Well, th that would be a pretty significant control, I would think, from the customer on their contractor that if you've got key safety positions that prior to anybody, you know, if one of those safety officers is, is raising an issue uh, prior to any termination or any type of action being dealt with that employee, the Department of Energy had to be consulted, had to be brought into that process. I mean, do, does, that program, does that control exist? Um, I'm not familiar with that specific element of the contractor. What I would like to do with your permission is to take that question for the record and provide you with a, an answer at a okay. later date. Mr. Eckro, do you, do you have, are you aware of, of a particular control in place in the Department of Energy governing these contracts of employees of the contractor having a, a heightened status because safety is such a huge issue that the contractor must consult with uh, the customer Department of Energy prior to taking any uh, employer action against an employee. Just like my uh, my colleague, Mr. Mowry, I'm no, not a lawyer as well, and I'm not familiar with any departmental policy that would govern the provision that you just mentioned. Okay, can, can you point, because again, we've talked about all these studies, uh, and we talked, you, you, you were going to say specifically this is what we've done. I, I just didn't hear any specifics. I, I heard, like I say, studies, processes, formal review systems. I mean, specifically, what kind of controls are in place to afford whistleblower protection to ensure that people that have legitimate safety concerns, where those concerns are, are adequately aired and, and addressed? I'll just, I'll, I'll just talk about uh, my office. The, the, the one thing that, that the department has done is, is really um, become aware of the importance of a, of a healthy safety culture in, in its organizations. A few years ago, um, we, we kind of had the awakening when, when uh, Mr. Thomas Itis raised his issues and he was removed from his position and the Defense Board raised uh, concerns. And, and that was the beginning of, of our and my office's first review of safety culture. We've learned a lot about safety culture and how to assess it, but the department is growing in its competencies in this area um, as we uh, 
understand the results of, of safety culture reviews. We brought in you know, external experts from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission who are really helping us understand this, this very different way in aspects of safety, including you know, things such as behavioral sciences that really you know, help inform us about how we have to interface and communicate with our employees much better. So you know, although um, the department has not reached maturity in healthy, uh, healthy safety culture, we are clearly learning the importance of it and, and growing in our abilities to manage it, but we and still the, the, are, we still have a lot of problems left. Department, to manage. The department's been around how many years? Department of Energy, when was it created? And it since well, if you go quite, back quite to that decades, Manhattan right? project, a long and it's time. been it's been overseeing these nuclear uh, waste sites for how many years? Well, over 50 years. And and so now you're you're saying that the Office of Health, Safety, and Security. Two years ago, we're just really kind of coming into understanding and, and dealing with safety and security issues. Right. Well, the whole department has really had an awakening since really the 2010 time frame. We didn't stick our head to the sand. We, we kind of ventured out to try to learn about this, and, and we're learning and growing, but we are not mature. I, mean, I, I, I appreciate that uh, you had an awakening two years ago, but what is shocking, literally. I mean, I've, I've been in business, and, and trust me, uh, f frequently because of governmental actions, things like OSHA. You know, businesses have been concerned about safety and security for decades. It's been a top priority within the private sector. It, it is a little mind-boggling, a little jaw-dropping that within the Department of Energy over, overseeing an incredibly complex, I'll give you that, very difficult issue. I mean, I, I wouldn't have to grapple with this. It, it's really been the last couple of years that we're, we're kind of pulling our head on the sand going, boy, you know, we really ought to you know, take a look at uh, safety and security concerns. I mean, I'm just, yeah. just, just a... Just, uh, just, one, just, one, just a commentary on that. Just one comment, if I could, sir. I mean, um, the Energy Department has has a, a very strong technical safety programs. We have a, a lot. We have our own internal regulations that that drive a lot of, of very good aspects of the occupational safety and health of our, of our employees. And we've really had that awakening the last about 20 years ago. Well, but the, we, the issue of safety culture is very different. It's a, it's a new part of of kind of the study of of safety. And this is an area that we are late to. So. And, and what I'm saying, in business, the idea of a safety culture is not new, not by any stretch of the imagination. You have to have specific controls so that your employees, people who work with you, know exactly what they need to do to raise safety concerns so they can be addressed you know, very quickly. Uh, that's what has to happen. But uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, assuming... Um, there's 10 minutes left on the vote, so I'm going to go ahead and do... Yeah, and That'd be great. Okay. Um, she was a key personnel. She's still listed on the contract as key personnel, Ms. Bushy. And as key personnel, she could not be fired without DOE approval. We know that happened. We know she was fired without DOE approval. What is the recourse DOE has against the contractor for doing that? Well, the, the uh, Bechtel provided to the department a letter that said they were going to be changing the key personnel list, adding two and removing one. However, having said that, at no time was the department asked or approved the dismissal of Ms. Bushy. And as I mentioned before, her dismissal did raise some concerns about reprisal for the fact that she had been raising issues. So that is why the department has taken the step to um, engage the, in the IG to take a look at the circumstances surrounding her, uh, her removal. And if, in fact, reprisal is found to exist, then the department will take action. And what would that be? Um, I, I don't know exactly what those actions would be. They would be dependent on the, on, you know, the results of the review. Um, I can get back to you with uh, very specifics about the actions that, or the, the steps that they could take to, to... Does it surprise you that they, um, what, two weeks after the secretary, who I'm a big fan of, Secretary Moniz, um, two weeks after he signed the, uh, the memorandum about safety and a culture of safety, and that they would cho choose that time to get rid of uh, Dr. Tomasitis, and then just a few months later, fire Ms. Bushy. Does that seem to be the actions of a contractor that's concerned about a culture 
that welcomes whistleblowers? I don't know the specifics of Mrs. Bushy's termination. Um, I believe you'll have to ask the next panel to get into some of the I'm specifics. I'm sure that they will not get into the specifics because uh, I'm sure that she was they will fired. say it's in litigation. Um, we have certainly made it very clear to our contractors that reprisal against uh, whistleblowers or people raising issues is totally unacceptable. Um, we have uh, different processes available to us if we do find that retaliation has occurred. That That's it, what I'm going to really watch carefully. Uh, you know, because I just, you know, you, you did the report in 2012. Now you're doing another one. You've called the IG. Meanwhile, the money keeps flowing. Costs keep escalating. Performance bonus keep give, being given. You know, I, at some point in time, the customer here um, needs to do something other than ask for another report. Um, because clearly, it, it doesn't appear that even the Secretary of Energy issuing a memorandum had much of a chilling effect on the company doing what they had to know what was going to be two high-profile dismissals. There is no two people at that plant that had a larger profile for having the courage to stand up on technical safety issues than those two people. Would you disagree with that statement, either one of you? No. So they, after the Secretary of Energy, the most powerful person in the country in regards to their contract, signs a written memorandum basically saying we can't have this kind of culture, they say, you know what, we're going to get rid of the two biggest, highest profile whistleblowers in the whole Hanford treatment facility. And then let me ask you about the next piece of this. Um, have you all discussed, and this may be uh, for someone other than the two of you, but this notion that contractors can litigate at our, on our dime, do you know how much we've forwarded them for legal costs at this point surrounding the dismissal of these two people? Uh, I don't have that information with me. We can provide that information to you at another time. You know, the notion that they defend themselves without telling you they were firing her. You know, they, they sent in something that they're going to try to argue, I'm sure, means they were getting rid of her, but they didn't tell you that. They just said they were changing key personnel. Um, you know, these cases go on for years, millions of dollars in legal costs. And at the end of that, if they settle the case without admitting any wrongdoing, then the taxpayer pay, stays on the hook, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chairman. Would you repeat that last piece At again? the end of a, a, a lengthy litigation. Correct. With expensive lawyers um, being paid by the government. If they settle at the end of this lengthy, or if they wear down the other side because the other side doesn't have the resources the United States government has, you can imagine if you're an individual trying to sue a company that's being bankrolled by the U.S. government. I mean, talk about hard. So there's a, there's a, there's a concept in, in litigation called wearing them down, papering them to death, overwhelming them with the resources of one side versus the other side. So let's assume that just a hypothetical case, not these individuals, in a hypothetical case, they wear someone down five, six, seven years. Finally, the person on the other side is out of money. Their life's been on hold. Their careers have been on hold. And many, many times they settle because they can't go on anymore. And if they settle and the defendant does not have to admit any kind of wrongdoing, then we stay on the hook. We end up having to cover all of those costs. Should uh, there be something that would incentivize litigants that we are funding that if it goes past a certain time or a certain amount of money spent, that they've got to have skin in the game in this legal fight? Well, I would say, Madam Chairman, that the, the cost to the contractor is not a done deal. It is up to the contracting officer to determine whether the legal costs are appropriate in the event that a case is settled, uh, whether they will be fully uh, allowable or partially allowable is up to the contracting officer. 
Well, that's good to know because I'll have some questions for the contracting officer on this case. What if we had a rule that if you didn't inform DOE, your customer, that you were firing key personnel, that you had to absorb all the legal costs of litigation surrounding that firing yourself and not ask the, company, the, the, the government for reimbursement? I mean, that's an interesting concept. Um, I'm not... I'd like to spend some more time thinking about it, and maybe we can provide you with some additional details. There just seems to be something wrong with this. Um, uh, our, our system is also based on the presumption that our contractors are not liable based on a, an a, a assertion um, by the contractor. Of course not. Of course not. Um, and, and nor would I want there to be an assumption. I just know that in terms of resourcing litigation, this is not an even playing field. And the way it's set up does not incentivize a quick resolution of the dispute. Uh, it, in it incentivizes lengthy litigation as opposed to a quick resolution. And it seems to me that we could work on doing something in that regard that might level the playing field slightly yeah. so that everyone had the, an opportunity to actually have their case adjudicated by an impartial jury. Right. Now, the, I, the vast majority of these that never gets there. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I understand your frustration, especially with uh, the length of time that some of these issues take to be resolved. Uh, we do follow the processes that were set up by Congress, um, and we are always looking for ways to improve the department's processes, and the whistleblower is one that we're also looking at also. Uh, we um, have discussed uh, earlier today the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. I didn't realize at the time that you were, uh, ha had given so many years of service there and, and to your country uh, as uh, in the military. Um, is there, can you give, you're a, a, the perfect witness to ask this question of. Um, why couldn't we give uh, DNFSB some kind of jurisdiction as a third-party oversight on a facility like Hanford? This is a little bit outside of, of what we were going to talk about today. And um, I would say that the, that the board and my, all my tenure there have been gone for a number of years, but it was really focused on the role of the board to help the department complete their mission. And in that context, their evaluations are based on the department's requirements and uh, evaluating the implementation of those specific requirements. So to give them a separate independent role, I don't, th I think it removes what the purpose of the board was put in place for when they were first established back in 1988. At, at the end of the day, uh, this controversy um, boils down to technical concerns highly technical concerns by two professionals in the field that had been given positions of great trust by your contractors. Do you feel comfortable, Mr. Morey, that their technical concerns have received the airing that they should? And as somebody with your background, uh, you know that they're not alone in the field with some of the technical con concerns that they expressed? Well, we have asked a contractor to put a consolidated list of all the issues that both Dr. Thomasitis and Ms. Pushy have, put, have voiced. Um, I'm, I'm well aware of many of those issues, and many of those issues were raised by other people and are being pursued. Uh, once we have that list, we'll evaluate them based on the, the technical merit of the issues that they have raised and make a determination at that time. But those issues um, are being worked. I mean, many of these issues, since this is a one-of-a-kind facility, it is incredibly complex. The technical issues are very complex, and they take a long time to resolve. So sometimes our failure is in the, in the fact that it takes us, we, are not, we have not in the past done a good job of getting the word back to the people that are raising these issues on where exactly in the process resolution of their issues stands. And that's one of the key things that we've been working on, and I think it's important um, to preventing this chilled work environment to make sure that people understand where those issues are being addressed and that they're not being ignored. Do um, either of you, are you familiar with the people that have been tasked with their responsibilities now at Hanford? Could you be a little more specific? The, the two jobs that they were removed from, two very important jobs. 
one in, in, in the technical capability and one in the safety EM capability. They were both high level people at that facility. Who's replaced them? Do you know? I'm not aware. I do not know the answer. Have you heard anything from either of those people about any of the same concerns? The people that replace them? Correct. Um, I have not heard anything. I'm not sure who is replacing those two individuals. Okay. Would it be a smart thing for the Department of Energy to go to their replacements and go through that list of concerns and see if they have the same ones? To take the impetus yourselves to ask those questions? Well, I think it would be appropriate to certainly to work with them and go through this list of issues and to, to determine the validity of those technical issues. I think that's fully appropriate. If you did they, that, if you did that, if you took the impetus to do that, that would remove the necessity of them being branded as whistleblowers. Well, and, and it would also give with. credibility to the concerns that were raised in the first place, that you were asking about those same concerns. In other words, you can't just replace these two people and have the concerns go away. That's correct. That's correct. Um, in the real world, I mean, I understand the benefit that whistleblowers have provided to our country in a number of, of different areas. If we were in an ideal world, we would have very few whistleblowers because when their issues are raised initially at those lower levels, we would address them, we would track them to closure, we would keep them informed of how we were progressing. And that whole process is something that we have been ex expending a lot of time trying to strengthen. I, I appreciate very much. I have to go vote. Um, if you have more questions, great. If not, this is the introduction for the uh, two witnesses that will. You want to hear the testimony, right? No, you can go ahead. I've read there. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll uh, I guess, dismiss you two. Oops. Uh, if you wouldn't mind staying in case we have questions after the other two witnesses testify, we would really appreciate it. Certainly. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we'll ask for the other, other witnesses to come forward then. Well, again, thank you for uh, being willing to appear before our committee, our subcommittee. Uh, our first witness is uh, James Taylor. He's Senior Vice President, Global Management and Operations Services at ERS Corporation, where he oversees strategic initiatives, business development activities, and administrative and operations support functions. Mr. Taylor leads the business unit responsible for ERS's work at the waste treatment plant at Hanford. Mr. Taylor has 26 years of experience in the nuclear industry including as director of the Savannah River National Lab. So, Ms. Taylor, welcome. And our, our second witness is uh, Michael Graham. He's the principal vice president at Bechtel National Inc. Mr. Graham has worked at four major Department of Energy sites across the country and previously led a project to evaluate the impacts of Hanford waste on groundwater in the Columbia River. So, again, I think it is the, the uh, uh, tradition of this subcommittee to ask people to swear in, so if you'd stand. Do you swear, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, Mr. Taylor, why don't you start your testimony? Good morning, Ranking Member Johnson and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is James Taylor. I am the general manager responsible for the environmental cleanup work under URS's Energy and Construction Division the role I assumed in January of this year. I am grateful to lead a team of, team of nearly 20,000 dedicated professionals working at 18 major cleanup projects in the U.S. and abroad. My business unit is responsible for the, our work on the waste treatment plant at the Department of Energy's Hanford nuclear site in Richland, Washington. I would like to provide you a brief introduction to the work we do at the waste treatment plant and discuss our company-wide commitment to safety. I also want to be very clear, URS has zero tolerance for retaliation against whistleblowers. This is firmly embedded in our company's culture and goes hand in hand with the dedication, our dedication to safety. As you are aware, projects at the Hanford site are intended to address once in a lifetime environmental challenges 
and we will eventually build a one-of-a-kind facility. There are currently more than 56 million gallons of nuclear waste stored in underground tanks at the Hanford site. The waste is a byproduct of nine nuclear reactors that operated at Hanford from World War II through the Cold War. Some of these tanks were constructed as early as the 1940s, and many are well beyond their design life. When operational, the waste treatment plant will be the first chemical waste processing facility in the world with the capacity to separate and stabilize nuclear waste. Our role at the waste treatment plant is to work with Bechtel, DOE's prime contractor at the site, to design, construct, and start up this treatment facility. We work under the direction of DOE and Bechtel. DOE is charged with managing the Hanford site and has the ultimate authority over the project from design to completion. It is imperative that we continue to develop and implement the technology needed to process this waste and complete the waste tre treatment plant as soon as safely possible. Understanding the unique safety and environmental demands of this project, we listen very seriously to feedback from congressional leaders, experts in the field, our employees, and members of the public and we are always open to new ideas. I know how important it is to get this right from a national perspective, but also from a local perspective. Hundreds of our employees live and work in this community, and no one is more committed than we are to the success of the waste treatment plant. We are proud of the safety record that we have built over many years at many facilities in the U.S. and abroad. We know we need to remain ever vigilant to protect and extend that record, which is why our corporation, our corporate culture, makes safety our highest priority. URS encourages its employees to raise safety concerns, and we are methodical in addressing the concerns they identify. We work closely with our employees to promote an open atmosphere because the complex issues we tackle attitude and creative solutions. Critical feedback and dissent are vital parts of our process, which is one of the reasons we encourage employees to raise concerns and challenge the status quo. We address all identified concerns and value these important contributions to our safety culture. We also continue to improve the safety culture at the waste treatment plant through internal and external reviews. Ms. Bushy joined the waste treatment plant project in March 2009. On February 18, 2014, Ms. Bushy's employment was terminated for cause due to her conduct and behavior. Ms. Bushy was not retaliated against because she raised safety concerns. Given the privacy interest at stake and the pending litigation relating to Ms. Bushy's employment, I am limited in what I'm able to say about this matter. I can say with confidence, however, that URS counts on our employees working at the front lines to remain vigilant about safety. For this reason, we have effective policies and procedures in place to encourage employees to raise safety concerns and a zero tolerance policy against retaliation to protect them when they do. I am proud of the work we at URS do to address some of our country's most difficult environmental challenges. We will continue to work with DOE and others to ensure the waste treatment plant is designed and constructed safely with the best available technology. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Graham. Yeah. Uh, Senator Johnson, I'm Michael Graham, uh, Principal Vice President of Bechtel National Incorporated. Bechtel designed and engineered the defense waste processing facility. Is your, is your mic on? Little red button. Oh, sorry. Um, Bechtel designed and engineered the defense waste processing facility at the Savannah River site in South Carolina. It's the only plant in the nation that currently converts liquid high level nuclear waste into solid glass, a process known as vitrification. This is the same process that will be used at WTP. The waste treatment plant at Hanford is being designed and built to meet a U.S. government commitment to the state of Washington to immobilize the highly radioactive waste stored in 177 aging underground tanks 
These legacy tanks of World War II and the Cold War date back to the 40s, and 67 of these tanks have been reported to have leaked over a million gallons of radioactive waste. The plant will take that radioactive tank waste, mix it into glass, and package it into robust containers for permanent disposal. This mission of radioactive waste that has been accumulated over generations is a challenge that has been handed to our generation by our parents and our grandparents. It is and will continue to be a very difficult, costly, and time-consuming venture. We owe it to our children and to our grandchildren to undertake this task and to bring it to successful conclusion. An essential element of our success in completing technically, technically challenging projects like WTP is creating and maintaining a strong safety culture that values a questioning attitude towards technical and safety issues. Raising and resolving technical issues is an integral part of our fundamental work process. All personnel are expected to fully and collaboratively participate in the identification and resolution of issues and concerns. In most instances, differences in professional opinions are resolved as a routine part of interactions between colleagues and management. But if these interactions don't effectively address a question, there are multiple avenues for project personnel to raise issues and concerns. The first is the Project Issues Evaluation Report, or PIER process. It's a tool for managing WTP's technical issues and opportunities for improvement. Issues raised in this peer process are fully transparent to the Department of Energy. This readily available process provides a mechanism for the resolution of any and all issues, be they raised by a project personnel or an external reviewer. The next level is the Employee Concerns Program, and it provides all personnel at WTP with an independent avenue for reporting and resolving concerns. And yet another level is, is differing professional opinions. This process is a formal mechanism for WTP personnel to resolve questions and concerns about the adequacy of the technical design where there's a legitimate disagreement regarding the appropriate technical path. The DPO process provides a formal review of the disputed issues by a, a technically qualified and independent panel with oversight by a DPO review board. So collectively, these represent a robust, best-in-class process for identifying and tracking and resolving issues and concern. I can assure you the WTP project will not be completed until all open technical questions have been resolved to the satisfaction of our team and the Department of Energy. The facility will then undergo a rigorous multi-year operational readiness review process. Operational testing will use surrogate materials to demonstrate that the plant will safety, safely operate as designed and will be performed before any hot nuclear operations can begin. This process took many years to complete. PF, the, the plant in South Carolina, was started up uh, in uh, the 90s. Finally, you've asked what role our company had in, in Ms. Bushy's dismissal. Ms. Bushy was an employee of URS, and URS alone made the decision related to the termination of, of Ms. Bushy. It is my understanding that we were informed by URS that they were considering terminating Ms. Bushy's employment for cause. I also understand that we were informed by URS that they, intend to proceed, they intended to proceed with termination, and we received a letter from URS formally notifying us of Mrs. Ms. Bushy's departure, which we then forwarded to the Department of Energy. We at Bechtel are extremely proud of our work at Hanford. It is an honor to serve as the government's lead contractor for this vitally important project. We welcome thoughtful criticism as a foundational component for our commitment to continual improvement. It's important to note that there are many enormous successes at the WTP project and we're committed to reaching that day when the plant is operating and safely processing nuclear waste to protect the Columbia River and the people of the Pacific Northwest. Thank you. Well, thank you both for your testimony. Let, let me just first ask, were either of you in the room when we were uh, talking with uh, Ms. Bushy? Yes, sir. Uh, anything from that discussion that you uh, want to respond to? Ms. Taylor. Yeah, I, I only heard the very end of her testimony. I, I, I can't 
I didn't. I don't have any comments from that. Mr. Graham. Um, I, was your question, was I here at the earlier session roundtable? Correct. Uh, I was not. Oh, okay. Uh, there was, let's say, a description of, uh, I would call it regulatory capture, or uh, basically that the contractors themselves are so overwhelmed, the Department of Energy in terms of design and, and safety concerns that, that almost renders the Department of Energy uh, moot in terms of their, their safety concerns. Uh, would you agree with that assessment? Um, I, I would not. I think there is uh, adequate oversight by the Department of Energy. Um, I've worked at a number of the sites um, and uh, in partnership with DOE to uh, work on these very difficult problems. Mr. Taylor? I, I agree. I think there is adequate oversight by DOE. Uh, we certainly focus on our oversight of our projects Mr. Graham, it sounded like you were informed by URS that Ms. Bushy was, was going to be terminated, and then you reported that to the Department of Energy. Is that, is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Do you believe, is that your duty under your contract? I mean, do you have, is there, because I was asking the, the folks from the Department of Energy, they didn't seem to be aware of any kind of contractual or legal obligation of, of a, you know, tick, you know, let's say a protected or a contractor dealing with safety. To, to notify the Department of Energy. Is, is your understanding that there is that uh, contractual obligation or legal obligation? It's my understanding that there is not a contractual obligation for us to uh, get DOE's approval if we're dismissing an employee for cause. Regardless, regardless of what position that employee may be in? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, that creates a problem for a whistleblower if it's a safety issue because a company could always then you know, not notify and, and, and take the position that you're obviously taking in this case that uh, the termination was for cause. Is, is, that, is that a little bit of a problem in, in the control process there? Um, I, um, I think this is a, this is a very uh, uh, interesting situation. Um, and again, this was a URS employee and URS right. took the action, we were informed. Let me state, as, as I did in that earlier meeting, I don't think this is the place to adjudicate an employer-employee dispute. And to a certain extent, that's part of this issue. But you also have you know, the very legitimate concerns of whistleblower protection, raising safety issues that I mean, I'd like to think everybody working on this project is, is highly concerned about. So you know, let's go into the types of controls that should be in place. Uh, Mr. Graham, you talked about a, a number of steps that uh, somebody who has a safety issue or concern can go through. Uh, at what point in those areas, because it sounded like there was uh, you know, the peer and then you had the employee concern avenue, said appeal to an in independent body. I mean, what independent body? So, so if, if there is an issue that raises to a, uh, a differing professional opinion, then, then resources outside the project with known expertise in these areas are brought in to help resolve the issue. But who, who pays for those resources? My understanding that's paid for by, by, uh, by the project as a, as a uh, allowable cost. So, so really it'd be the, the contractor employing a, or co contracting with a subcontractor to provide that, that expertise. I mean, there would probably be some issues of independence there, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? Well, I think our, all of our processes are, 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 are very transparent. Um, and so, you know, just as we've done in the commercial nuclear industry, that first uh, tier of, of the opportunity for people to raise concerns is, is a very low threshold, high volume uh, process. And so it has in there issues like um, they don't like somebody smoking at the work site. Two, you know, uh, other concerns about, about safety or other things. And those are all uh, tracked uh, and all those will be reviewed before the plant enters into any kind of a startup phase. Re reviewed by who? So it's reviewed by the Department of Energy okay. and, and by, our, our, by our management team. So, so, so somebody who has a real safety concern goes through these processes can be assured that the Department of Energy is going to be well aware of somebody raising an issue. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I was certainly concerned about just differing professional opinions. And we talked about the uh, Fukushima site where 
you know, apparently the experts back there in the design phase said we should have built higher you know, tsunami walls to protect the, the diesel generators, the cooling generators. Uh, I've, I've spoken with some nuclear experts in the past that that, that instance has, has resulted in really a, a different design uh, idea that what we ought to do is just put a big old tank of water over the reactor so it can be filled with any uh, power source. And to me that makes a lot of sense. Now, now there's, there's a difference of, of expert opinion prior to basically a continuous improvement process where you actually have a, an instant that says, well, that wouldn't have worked either. This works better. How do you how, describe the, the resolution in differing professional expert opinions, which can be pr pretty strongly held? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you resolve those things? Who in the end is the arbiter? Who makes the decision on what could be some very strongly held differences of, of expert opinion? Well, I think, uh, you know, at, at the um, end of the day, we, we are the, the uh, project manager and, and we would take our recommendations forward to the Department of Energy and we would gather the input from the best and brightest. Um, as we talked about, this is an incredibly complex uh, uh, plant. Um, and so I think just to put it into perspective, the, the footprint of, of WTP is, is over 60 acres, and the Pentagon sits on about 41 acres. So but but, but, but in, in the end, it would be the Department of Energy. If, if you've got a, a pretty close call, technical issue, you know, the, right. there, there's a difference of opinion, and, and a decision has to be made. Is that the contractor that makes the decision on that, or is it the Department be, of Energy that in the end, as the customer, makes the, the final call? It would be, the, it would be our recommendation with, with DOE's approval. So you'll make a recommendation, but DOE in the end has the control of the process. And they'll, they'll, they'll decide between the alternatives based on the information you're providing them. And with a, a lot of input from, from uh, external de the defense board and others. The, uh, again, I understand the constraint here, which is the reason this isn't a very good place to adjudicate the employer employee uh, issue here. But within that constraint, can, can you describe to me what, what is the area of disagreement? between the two whistleblowers that we talked to earlier uh, and Bechtel and Department of Energy in, in terms of the, the safety issues. Can, can you at least describe that? Uh, I could, um, I'm obviously not steeped in all the details of that plant uh, in, in these issues, but I, I can give you a landscape picture. Um, the, the issues, as I understand it, have been raised uh, by these individuals are, are uh, as was stated earlier, issues that other people have also raised. Um, I can assure you that at each of these issues is being formally tracked and will be tracked to closure in those systems that I described. Mr. Taylor, you have anything to add there? I mean, can, can you get a little, a little more specific in terms of what, what is the issue at, at hand? I mean, we, we heard some pretty scary things about hydrogen explosions and, and uh, you know, some, some, some relatively scary uh, issues being being uh, raised here. Well, Senator, I uh, unfortunately can't get into more detail. Uh, I just took over the position as general manager approximately eight weeks ago. Uh, I have asked my executive vice president to go investigate the concerns that were raised, uh, the, the, the nuclear safety concerns at the site. He's investigated those. Those are the, uh, what I'm told is that uh, all of the issues that have been raised are being tracked uh, and, and corrective actions put in place and, and, and that uh, it's a work in progress. And again, when you say track, this is going to be going through a process that's very transparent. The Department of Energy is, is well aware of these things, correct or incorrect? I mean, is this just being tracked internally within the, the contract and subcontractor base or is the Department of Energy fully engaged uh, fully looking over your shoulders in terms of you know, what, what issues are being discussed, what concerns are being raised? I haven't been engaged to that level of detail to know the details uh, of the list, but I've been told that, that they are being tracked. But again, when you say tracked, that means full transparency and the Department of Energy would be involved in these? That's correct. That's right. my understanding. Mr. Graham, you have anything to add to that? No, that's correct. Um, Mr. Graham, you, you were talking about, uh, and I think, I think it was you, but well, actually, Mr. Taylor, you're also director of the Savannah River National Lab. Uh, one of the questions I had during the earlier session is, is there, it, it sounds like those 
cleanup sites are, are progressing. The plants have been uh, constructed. We're, we're actually uh, solving the problem there. Is there something dramatically different at the Hanford site versus uh, other sites that are currently operating? Um, I, I can provide a little background on that. Um, the, uh, the Hanford site uh, had uh, five different uh, processes to, that they utilized to separate the plutonium through the years. And so the uh, Savannah River site had one. And so the complexity of the 56 million gallons of waste that's sitting in these failing tanks is much more complicated than it is at, at Savannah River. And, and so the, the, uh, the, even though the fundamental aspect of making glass is, is well understood and is operating well within uh, Savannah River, these different processes in the early days of the Manhattan Project makes this a much more challenging project. Would either of you be willing to or care to comment on your own evaluation in terms of the expertise that, that resides within the government agencies that are involved with you? Uh, d does the government have enough resources, do they have manpower, do they have the, the requisite skills of the people in the position to, to with transparency of a tracking process, uh, really understand what the issues are and, and be in the position that when you make a rec recommendation on you know, di different uh, uh, ideas in terms of how to handle these problems, that in the end the Department of Energy is, is well enough versed and has the expertise to, to make the intelligent uh, decision there? And I realize that might be kind of a difficult question for, to ask, but... No, I, I, I actually, uh, I, I think uh, absolutely. Uh, I personally know Kevin Smith, who uh, is the head of the DOE's operation at, uh, at Hanford for the Office of River Protection. Um, I had the honor of working with him when I was at Los Alamos, uh, managing the cleanup of that site. Um, I've had a lot of experience with the uh, Department of Energy Environmental Management over the years, and they have uh, um, a depth and breadth of expertise that I know that the Japanese, when they had their issues with, uh, with Fukushima, turned to the Department of Energy here for support. Ms. Taylor? I think the Department of Energy has significant resources, number one. They're well-trained and qualified. Uh, many of the DOE uh, folks have worked in the commercial world, so they've worked for contractors like Bechtel and URS. So I, I would agree that, that uh, they have the expertise to, you know, to, to work with the contractors and provide good oversight. Again, you're probably not the best people to ask this question, but c can you think of anything in the Department of Energy or any of the government agencies overseeing your work, in any controls, uh, that either in place that simply don't work, that are just burdensome, uh, could be replaced by, by better controls that uh, would provide better transparency and, and certainly address and, and protect whistleblowers? I don't have anything that comes to mind at this point. But w one of my concerns is, is the disparity of, of uh, just who pays legal fees. And as it was described in the earlier meeting, uh, the, the legal fees to modern defense for the contractors is, is really reimbursed by the government. Uh, the whistleblowers themselves, apparently, I'd imagine it's because they were terminated with cause, ha have no one in terms of uh, paying for legal fees, which, which ends up being, a, really puts them at a huge disadvantage. Uh, do you agree with that fact that it puts them at disadvantage? Is, is there a better process for, for whistleblower protection potentially right within the Department of Energy? I think we'd be uh, happy to engage in those discussions, um, but I, I, I don't, uh, um, I didn't come prepared to talk about that aspect of, of this situation. Okay, Mr. Taylor? I don't have anything to add. I, I, we, we, we could provide our technical experts inside our company to support you on that. Uh, I think that's really what we have to, you know, I think this committee really has to be taking a look at that and you know, how can we offer the appropriate uh, whistleblower protection uh, how, how can we ensure in safety? And it's, to, to me, the government is the customer. They ought to be in charge. That's certainly the way it was in my business. I mean, I, we, we had pretty well, you know, when, when our customer said jump, we jumped, and, and we did what they were, was required. So uh, certainly want to look. But again, I, I want to design these things to facilitate safety uh, as, as, you know, as cooperative a process as possible. I would like to just turn to, from my standpoint, a little bit of a conundrum, uh, certainly uh, that I would be concerned about trying to find any company uh, w willing to work 
on this project. Uh, th this is a once in a lifetime problem. It's a very diff difficult problem. H how many companies in the world could be viewed as, as viable contractors to do something like this? I mean, what, what, what is the universe, the known universe of potential suppliers here? I think if you look at the companies that have the expertise, the capabilities, and experience to do this work, there are only a handful. I think that URS, uh, from an operation standpoint and startup and test of, of significant facilities like this, we're one of the leaders. I think Bechtel, in the same sense, when it's doing the engineering, uh, procurement, construction, they're, they're known to be the best in the world. Um, and if you look outside that, there are other companies uh, that operate similar facilities. Uh, for example, in France, there's Arriva. Uh, and, I, and I know there are other companies outside in Japan and other countries that also have that capability. But in the U.S., it's a very small group. And, and I would say that URS and Bechtel are the leaders in, that, in this business. Do, do you know of any companies that might have the capability that just refuse to do it? Or started working on a project like this and just walked away out of just sheer frustration and mounting losses. Did that ever happen? I'm not aware of, of not, that happening. I'm not aware. I'll say that, you know, we are, um, and, and I won't speak for URS, but I think we are fully committed to this really critical and difficult mission. And uh, we've got thick skins and we're going to stick it out. And this is kind of harkening back to the, the hearing we had back in June, but just, just refresh my memory. Talk about how these contracts are, are tailored. You know, what is, what is the review process? Uh, how often are, is, are they renegotiated? What's, you know, what are the cost escalator uh, provisions of it? Can you just really kind of describe in detail how this all comes about and how it's managed on an ongoing basis? Well, <clears throat> Yeah, the, and, and I was here in, in June when we discussed this, that, um, you know, the original contract uh, for uh, waste treatment plant was for uh, to fast track a pilot plant to get on with the waste. Um, that scope was, was uh, expanded, uh, and, to, and it now includes the uh, future uh, larger plant that was going to be a phase two, so it was to do, do it all at once. That change was managed through uh, a, a very formal change uh, management program for contract management within DOE. And so all changes in scope, um, all issues associated with managing through these complex things are handled through formal change control uh, with approval of the contracting officer for the Department of Energy. And are those all co cost plus contracts? I mean, how, 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 how do you... This, this particular uh, contract is cost plus. And what, what is the plus? I mean, so what do you expect uh, above your cost? What, what do you, and again, your costs are, are, are fully loaded. I mean, f is that a full costing system then plus a, a percentage plus, profit? Plus incentive fees or, or right. Uh, but, but the cost is our, our cost of, of uh, our uh, materials and people. So in terms of your contract so far, how, how much have you been paid by the government? You know, I, I, I'd be glad to provide that uh, for the record later. I'm not prepared to answer that today. I'd, I'd appreciate that information. Then do you have any sense for just your percent profitability? I, I, I don't. Um, what, what is the plus of the cost plus? Do you, do you know what that percentage is that's called out in the contracts? I, I, I do not. Okay. This well, again, I, I would certainly appreciate that for the record. You bet. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for helping us accommodate and thank you all for helping us accommodate a aggressive schedule of voting at the same time that we're trying to have hearings with people who have disrupted their schedules to accommodate ours. So it's, um, it's, it's the chaos of the scheduling of the Senate. I apologize for it. Um, let me first um, make sure I understand both of your positions, especially URS. Thank you. Um, Mr. Taylor, um, about notification of DOE about removing two folks, um, both of you should answer this, about what you feel like your legal obligation is in terms of notifying uh, your customer uh, over firings of two people who had had a very high profile in terms of uh, 
discussing technical concerns of relating to safety. Do you feel that either of you had an obligation to tell DOE that you were letting these folks go? Out of courtesy, uh, and I'll speak to, to, to Ms. Bushy, out of courtesy, we routinely notify our customers if we have significant issues uh, that, for example, in regards to Ms. Bushy, we did have some uh, individual raise concerns about her conduct and behavior, uh, and, and they were they were severe, and basically I, the need, I needed to notify DOE to let them know that, that be, because Donna is a key person, because these are severe, severe uh, you know, claims against her that I needed to, to let them know, especially given that she, she is a whistleblower, uh, and URS is, absolutely, we don't support action or retaliation against whistleblowers, so we just needed to let DOE know. So we felt that because of that, there was an obligation. From a, a personnel issue, when, when you're terminating employee for cause, uh, there, my understanding, and I'm not an attorney or, I'm, uh, or an expert on the matter, but the notifying DOE is, is not formally required. So it's not formally required. Are you saying that you did it? I'm saying that I notified my counterpart in DOE that we have significant issues associated with an employee, Ms. Bushy, about her conduct and behavior, and that they were severe, and, and, and it was just a notification. They were not notified uh, that, from, that we had re actually done the investigation, that we confirmed the findings, and, and then we moved to terminate her. They did not know that, that we had terminated her until after the fact. Okay, and, and it's your belief that that's not legally required? That is my belief. And, and let's assume it may not be legally required, but you think it might be a good idea to tell them that you were firing her under all those circumstances that you just delineated? Just from a management perspective? What would be the reason you wouldn't want to tell them? Well, I was, from a human resources standpoint, and I have experts um, uh, that that uh, basically we should. These are private issues with employees. They Wait, go back you just said you already told them you had severe issues with her conduct. You did that. You weren't worried about her privacy then. That you had serious ongoing conduct issues, so you weren't didn't hesitate to already poison the well, so to speak. But you didn't think that you thought somehow telling them that you'd fired her was somehow a kinder thing to her since you'd already done that? I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Why would you go to them in the first place and tell her you had problems with her? Unless you were paper in the file. Uh, it, was, it was out of courtesy to our, our primary customer to notify them that, that we had these allegations and were investigating. But you didn't think it was a courtesy that, to, to let them know that you fired her? Uh, following the termination, we, we did call, I called my counter, counterpart and informed them that, that uh, about the conditions around her termination at a very high level. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the non-disclosure form. Is, I've had a chance to, my staff's had a chance, I should accurately say, to look at the non-disclosure form. It's my understanding that there's nothing in the non-disclosure form that delineates the ongoing superior rights of an employee to report uh, safety concerns to either an IG or to Congress, that that is not included in your disclosure report. Is that correct? Well, your non-disclosure um, agreement that someone has to sign when they come to work for you? Uh, I'm not an attorney or an expert on, on the legal issues around a non-disclosure form, um, so I, I really can't address that. It's not my understanding that that is a document that gets in the way of any employee raising concerns. It's we have to have an open environment. Folks have to have the opportunity to raise safety concerns. You know, we can't start up these complicated high-risk nuclear facilities if there's any risk uh, uh, of safety to our employees, the environment, the public. So uh, it's, it's my understanding that that, 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 that does not prevent uh, employees from coming forward. Do you acknowledge, either one of you, that you have an issue with the culture there, that people don't believe they can come forward? 
Do you see that as a problem that you need to manage? We, we, take, uh, we, we obviously take this very seriously. Uh, we'll continue to uh, encourage people to bring uh, any issues that they have forward. Um, as I said in my, in my oral testimony, we have several mechanisms for people to do that. Um, if they want to remain anonymous, they can. And all of those issues are openly tracked. DOE has access to that information, and we, cl we make sure that we track those and appropriately close those issues. Do you believe the issues that were raised by the two people that were terminated have been adequately tracked and taken care of? I can tell you that uh, I can assure you that all of the issues that they raised or were, as was pointed out earlier, many of which were raised by others, are being formally tracked to closure within our system. Okay. So if we have a list of those, you could give us that information for the, for the committee record? Yes. Yes, Madam so are there any technical issues that either of these people raised that you thought did not, that were off the wall or irrational or reflected uh, something other than a sincere desire to point out technical problems that they foresee could arise or safety problems that could arise? Well, I just would say that, you know, in our process that uh, we, we go through and make sure that each of those is vetted by appropriate individuals, and I, I'm not in a position to prejudge how those matters will be resolved. That would not be appropriate. Okay. Have any of them been resolved that they wrote? Because some of these go back years, especially Dr. Thomas Sidis. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I, I, uh, can, I don't have those details, but I'd be glad to provide the status of I would all hope the issues. that one, I think some of them were raised as early as 10 years ago. I, I would hope they'd been tracked and resolved. I'm just not prepared to give you the details today, but okay. I'll, I'll glad to If do you that. would get those details for us, we would like to see how those concerns have been tracked and resolved. Okay. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about legal fees. How much have you guys spent defending yourself um, on these lawsuits? Do you know? I, I have no firsthand knowledge of, of what the legal fees have been. Do you know, Mr. Graham? I'm sorry, I do not. Is somebody at your company that would know? Uh, yes, obviously we, could, we will uh, be glad to provide that. For Do the you have record. any idea what the hourly rate is that you're being charged for representation? I have no idea. We'd like that too. And it's my understanding all that's government money that's paying for that? Okay. Right? Do you know that? I, I do not know. Okay. I know there are some splits in what's covered and what's not. I'm just not an expert on that. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, we'll have a series of questions about that because um, there is a, a real uneven playing field um, as it relates to having a case adjudicated of this nature. And I'm not one here. I don't know who's right and who's wrong, honestly. Um, it's not my place. That's a court of law. But I know how expensive it can be to get to a court of law, especially if one side has a lot of resources and the other side has zip. It puts the side with the superior resources in a commanding position. And you can see how that could be offensive if, in fact, those commanding resources are coming from the United States government. I mean, it's one thing to fight your employer when you feel like that you have been treated badly. It's a whole other thing when they're being bankrolled by the United States government. And that's why I think we've got to look at this issue. Because as long as you guys don't admit guilt, it's my understanding that the federal government picks up the tab. So hypothetically, not that you are doing that in this case or not that you would do this, but hypothetically, a contractor could draw out a case as long as possible, weaken the plaintiff significantly, financially and over time, and then get a settlement and never have to pay a dime of their own money for their legal defense, whereas the other side who wanted an adjudication is denied that opportunity just by being worn down. And that's what I, I'd like to get at. And so we're going to ask a lot of questions um, around that in terms of timing, um, how long do these cases take, has, has anyone availed themselves of arbitration, are they willing to, or more importantly, um, is it maybe an issue where at a certain point in time, if you go so long and spend so much, that it begins to be the company's dime rather than the United States government's dime. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to 
chill people wanting to do business with the federal government by them thinking that they're going to be subjected to costly litigation. On the other hand, this doesn't seem fair to me, um, the way this is currently uh, situated. Um, I didn't have a chance to hear uh, your testimony live. I wanted to give both of you an opportunity if there were points you made in your testimony that you want to make sure that I hear. Um, we, I try very hard to read everything, both before and after hearings, but I, I am, want to confess that there are times that I don't get a chance to read everything, so I didn't want to give either of you, uh, to dismiss either one of you without you having a chance to, to point out anything uh, to me that you think I need to know. Chairman, I, I would just like to state, uh, and I stated it in my opening remarks, that um, URS has a zero tolerance for retaliation against whistleblowers. We did not terminate Ms. Bushy as retaliation against the, the nuclear safety issues she brought up. We're very concerned about any issues that are raised at our sites because of the consequences that exist at these high hazard nuclear operations. So, so we want to make sure we have an open environment at our sites for people to raise concerns so that they can be addressed appropriately. Uh, the, uh, it, it is unfortunate, um, and, and it was a, one of the toughest decisions I've made in my career. Uh, I took over as a general manager eight, seven weeks ago. Um, it was brought to my attention through an, our employee concerns program, where we had employees that filed uh, complaints against Ms. Bushy's conduct and behavior. We investigated those. Uh, we validated those concerns, and, and I had to make the really hard decision to terminate Ms. Bushy. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you go ahead, Mr. Graham, if you had anything that you wanted to bring to my attention. Um, I think the only thing I wanted to put into perspective is that, um, you know, the real, the, where the real risk is, 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 is in doing nothing, and that we have uh, 56 million gallons of high-level waste sitting in failing tanks. Um, and that this is a very long and complex mission that we're fully dedicated to and we will not be successful in if we don't have this open uh, process for people to raise their issues and concerns. We do that in government work. We do that in a private sector. And so we're fully committed to uh, completing the mission, starting up the plant safely. It will go through a very rigorous startup process that will take m multiple years and so a lot of the issues that are raised is what if when the plant is operating, um, we will get there. And uh, I look forward to the day when we're, when the plant is operational and we're protecting the people of the Northwest and the Columbia River. We are captured by the severity of the situation and the technical expertise that is required. But I want to make sure that in our effort to address that, that we are not taking shortcuts, Absolutely. that we will look back and regret. And I think, as we talked about in the previous hearing, the design-build concept for something like this is literally like trying to build an airplane in the air. And um, the, the delays that have occurred and the budget increases that have occurred, looking back, I know this is Monday morning quarterbacking, but looking back, might have been better to design first and probably you know, now that we know how long this is going to take, may have actually saved time in the long run. Um, let, me, let me ask a little bit about Dr. Um, Temesitis. Um, in 2010, he raised, um, came to the managers at Bechtel and US, URS with a list of about 50 serious technical concerns at WTP. Um, and shortly after he raised those concerns, the Bechtel manager, Frank Russo, wrote Bechtel and URS officials and said, quote, we need to kill this BS now. Walt, quote, Walt is killing us. Get him in your corporate office today, end quote. 
and then he was ultimately reassigned. Now, were there issues with Dr. Tomasitis that you allege were true with Ms. B that he was difficult to work with and a behavioral problem and so forth? That, that is the allegation that you're making against Donna Bushy. Um, you understand that this, this looks very bad in terms of a culture that encourages people to come forward with technical concerns. Um, can, do you have any response to someone calling his 50, this, you know, talking about him killing us and this BS after he has raised these concerns? Chairman, I, um, I'm new to the job. I don't know if you caught that part of the, the message. I've been on this job about eight weeks. Before that, I was in charge of business development. I have no first-hand knowledge of uh, uh, Dr. Tamasitis and, and the actions that were taken at that point in time. So I, I can get back with you um, and provide additional information working with my team that, that were around at that time. Well, I think that's important. Um, and I think um, I think that, that we need to know um, your perspective on that because it, 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 I think you, the essence of this hearing is, I understand what your words are, but we have outside agencies time and time again citing problems with the culture at that facility in terms of people feeling like they can come forward with concerns. And the way these two cases have been handled, the courts will decide. I hope the courts get a chance to decide. I hope that this isn't one of those that they get worn down and everybody agrees to settlements that nobody ever gets to know about. Um, but that's, the, that's not my say. That's the litigant's decision as to what happens. But uh, you guys have a serious problem in terms of whistleblower culture out there. And we're going to have to do something to make sure that people understand that they are not going to be moved to the basement, they are not going to be laid off, they're not going to be fired for raising legitimate concerns. And um, we will look forward to your additional information that you will give us, and we'll have some more questions for the record. And unfortunately, the bell is calling me again to go vote, so we will con conclude the hearing at this point.